there is this pressure that I think many of us feel where because we're born into a bloodline, we have to love no matter what that bloodline. And it's just not the case. Mm -hmm. If I have a friend in my life or a colleague that treats me like garbage and I let them know the healthy bright line boundary and they continue to not honor that boundary, I say goodbye. And I think we can apply yeah. that same thing to parents. It, there's no reason that you have to keep going back to the well and drinking the poison. There's yeah. just no reason for that. Yeah. Josh Trent is the host of the Wellness Wisdom Podcast, and he's just a wealth of wisdom about health, about life. He's lived a lot of powerful experiences from his own medicine journey to all of the amazing podcast guests he's had, including myself, of course. And so I wanted to share this beautiful conversation with my friend, Josh Trent. The truth is, is that we're all the master. We're all the healer. We're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus. Well, here we are smoking a cigar. And this is a tradition that I learned from my stepfather. Hmm who doesn't really smoke cigars, but whenever my sisters were born, I was young, I was like 11, and he had all of his sons and me, and we smoked a cigar. And I've recognized that there's a fatherhood tradition about smoking a cigar, smoking a cigar with your friends and your family and whatever, like when you have a baby. Yeah. And we're a little late. We haven't seen each other in a little while, but yeah, nonetheless, yeah. here yeah. we are, Thank time you, warping man. back, celebrating huh. the birth of your child, and we're going to talk a little bit about fatherhood. Yeah, yeah. Wow, over a year ago. My yeah. son's uh, 13 months. So thank you for my, actually, you're the only guy I know that said, let's smoke a cigar for your boy. So thank <laughs> See, you, so man. So I wasn't late at all. No, it's was perfect right on time. Let's go. Let's go. So yeah, I mean, I think the uh, this is one of the big crucibles and initiations that all of us go through. I think for men, having a son is a particular type of thing as well because, you know, you're fu and And also likewise, there's, there's different crossovers, of course, if you know, you're a mother who has a son or mother who has a daughter. Everything is its own unique pairing, but there's something particularly interesting about that. And both of us being men, both of us have relationships with our own fathers. And you are getting the opportunity to start to repattern, reprogram, reprint, re-understand that relationship, and both yeah. backwards and forwards. And I've had to do a lot of work backwards with my father. And I want to talk about that because there's some new scenes and, and info that I've released for the first time publicly about, you know, my father's mental illness and how that's, you know, how that relationship has been. And that's in my new uh, director's cut documentary, Awake in the Darkness. So lots of stuff to talk about. And we'll just use that as a jump off point. Yes. Wow. Well, in order for us to be a father, we have to tend to the child inside of us. So if I'm not healing or if I'm not healed to a point, then whatever I'm doing with my son or my daughter, my child, it's going to come through. In other words, when you have kids, everything that you thought you had healed or everything that you thought was pure, it gets even more pure. It gets even more healed. And specifically- Is that because you, is that because you feel like you need to? It's I like, don't think it's because we need to, but specifically it's because in order for me to hold a space for my son, in order for me, a, a, for me to be a true father to him, I have to tend to this boy inside of me that maybe is still angry at his father right. or maybe still has some stuff that is needing to clean up, like a cosmic cleanup. And that's been the case for me, man, since we last chatted over this past year. You know, definitely a huge soul journey with like, how do you be a father, tend to your responsibilities, take care of your business, but also tend to your spiritual self. Mm -hmm. Like it's really easy to just like be heady and be intellectual and take care of all the stuff, but to really, really be there for my woman, my work and my son, it's a, it's a tall order. And I think like now, even the demands on men in the world, it's even bigger. I don't know if there's ever been a time where men are asked more of, but also like it's time for us to be that way anyways. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It's, uh, you listen to someone like, Elon Musk respond to, you know, questions about being a father. And it's like, yeah, going to miss that one. Kind of. I mean, and I don't want to like put words in his mouth or paraphrase unnecessarily, but it kind of felt like the vibe was like, I got to be father to the world in the way that I think about it. And, you know, I hope my kids are going to be all right yeah. type of thing. And I think we all have a little bit of that Musk tendency of being like, 
look, I'm just working to set the world in order in the best way possible, whether that's financially or whether that's offering my gift and medicine to the world. And then to add this other very specific layer of father to one child or two children is seems like an enormous load to add. But for every father that I've talked to, it's, a, it's also incredibly clarifying of like the purpose behind it. Yeah. I think for me, the big question I always ask myself, I was like, how do I do it all? How do I, I different journeys that I've been on, different mentors that I've met with, how do I hold all of it? Because right. I came from an experience where, you know, my dad did the best that he could, but sometimes- Which is kind of always the case. Always the case. But sometimes the best that parents can do actually isn't enough. It's always, oh, that's <laughs> always the case. I yes. mean, basically they're always doing their best and it's always not enough. Right. For the most part, yeah. yeah. Unless you're born on some magical planet where parents do enough. I don't know where that planet well, is. Well, you'd but... have to be, the your parent would have to be actually in unmediated contact with the divine because we divinize our parents. We we like place God on their face because they're our entire universe. Yeah. So unless they're in unmediated contact with the divine, you know, divine spirit, what the Kabbalists would call Retzon Hashem, like God speaking through them and just looking at you every day like, tell me your story, my child, tell me more. And just no matter what you do, unflinching love. Yeah, then they're enough, <laughs> you know, but anything short of the divine is going to be something that we're going to have to brace for yeah. ultimately. And, and, and so we can't be everything to our kids ultimately. And maybe that's what we, not maybe, that is what we signed up for. Right. So everybody drinks from this river of forgetfulness and then we get to the world and we're like, oh, I'm remembering who I am. And then you have parents that offer you contrast and that contrast is either really fucking deep or it's kind of deep. Right. But, it's, but there's always contrast. So like exactly. the contrast where I came from was my mom was bipolar. My dad left home when I was two, two months actually. And so it's not to shame them. I'm not, I'm not sitting here on your podcast going, oh, it was so hard. Because I think most people's journeys, they have to be in a deep contrast. Yeah. There's no way around that, especially if you want to do big stuff in the world. I have never interviewed someone or been around somebody successful that didn't have some kind of deep, dark contrast where they came from. Most people that make anything of themselves, they have, they have like this... I don't know how to describe it, almost like a black hole of right. contrast and pain that they came from. And I mean, mine, mine was just the same, you know, different than yours, obviously, but I think we share that. I think that's a commonality with you and I, mm. where we see the best in people and we didn't necessarily come from an environment that was perfect or that was setting us up to be taken care of at all times. We had to learn how to take care of ourselves. Yeah, it's mine, you know, my story is interesting in that the feminine lineage of my family from my mom and my grandma was as close to unconditional love, as close to that Retzon Hashem, as close to that divine, you know, divine consciousness coming through them as possible. So my relationships with the feminine have always been like really kind of easy and solid. Not that they always liked me or I didn't get frustrated or jealous or whatever. Yeah. There's things with the lover that's different than with the mother. You know, so I still had to go through all the lover challenges, but that side, that whole side, you know, the deep reverence for the feminine, all of these different things, the feeling that I could be loved in that way by a woman, I've always had that. On my dad's side, though, it was different. There was a lot of intellectual connection, which was beautiful, the ability to like solve puzzles together and figure things out. And, yeah. you know, there's so much beauty in my relationship with my dad, but there was also intense rage you know, as one, as one component and definitely a lot of conditionality in the expression of his love. And it didn't have to be him saying anything, just the difference between him being really quiet when I didn't have a great basketball game versus him being full of love and joy. Like kids can read your energy, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and the energy when I didn't play well or didn't perform well and whatever it was, was like, I'm not proud of you and I don't love you as much today. Mm -hmm. Even though you could still say like, love you, you know, I love you but it did, you didn't feel it, you mm -hmm. know? So it created this dissonance between what I was feeling and what actually he that's, would have expressed. That's because kids have like the ultimate ESP. Kids mm -hmm. don't listen to what you say. I mean, obviously, I mean, eventually right. they do, but when you're super young, like our nervous system is so fresh, we're like a rose. <laughs> yeah. We are literally like the softest rose and anything that I feel inside myself, that's like not loving, or if I get pissed off because Nova's crying, he can feel that on some level that maybe I'm still even understanding that I forgot. 
Mm -hmm. He can feel everything. So when Carrie and I are good, he's good. Yeah. But when we're not good, when we're fighting or when there's uh, interstitial tension in the relationship, um, kids can do that. So we have to be, as fathers, we have to be so pure, not perfect, because <laughs> I don't know any, any father that's fucking perfect, but we have to be so pure that it just gives us space for our kids to live their life without being clouded from our wounding. Yeah. I heard a story um, that was told secondhand about a psychiatrist who was studying you know, early onset schizophrenia. And he was working with, uh, with a child who had really like intense schizophrenia. And uh, I heard this, this story from, uh, from Rabbi Gaffney. But finally, the psychiatrist gets the kid to calm down, kind of starts to quiet the voices in the, in the episodes that he's having, and then invites his mother. And, and his mother comes in and is like, you know, Johnny, that's what she said. But what she was actually, the energy she was pushing out was like daggers, disownment, I hate you, like you're a d fucking disgrace. So it was this two, two sets of contradicting information that was coming at him. And so the, the thesis of the psychiatrist was, is like, this is what creates these rifts, these splits in the psyche. When somebody is saying something, but they're telling you something completely different with their body, then the brain doesn't know what the fuck to think about it. And in this extreme case, it caused an actual split of you know, the person's psyche. And I think this is the nature of gaslighting. This is why it's so you know, dangerous in relationship in all forms of manipulation where somebody will be saying something but transmitting a whole different energy. It, it's so difficult for us to receive this contradictory sets of data and it really fucks with us. Yeah, because it's hard to be authentic at times. Yeah. because of fear yeah. i get conditioned that fear is actually the way to go because it's, i've seen it with my parents so my mom and dad mirrors fear to me and i think okay as long as i do that fear path then i'll be safe which yeah. is so wild because there's some part of everyone's psyche that is so addicted to being safe and sometimes like that safety actually just eats up people's dreams like i know it did for me there, there's no way that I would ever be sitting here with you if I didn't constantly lean into my fear, constantly try to understand like, what is fear telling me? Is that shit even real? Even mm. coming over here today, I'm like, hmm, interesting, imposter syndrome. Okay, cool. What are you mm. here to teach me? Like, yeah. what are you actually here to teach me now? And really there's just like still a part of me, there's still a part of my child that is learning how to be a man in this world. And I think like I can say that because a lot of men feel that way. Even new dads feel that way. Yeah. You know, nobody's perfectly prepared. And I think the more honest we can be about where we are in our consciousness and our evolution it takes the pressure off, dude. You know, just me saying yeah. that, it like takes the pressure off. Yeah. The stuff that we keep inside hidden, you know, that we're just patterning and compounding and impounding shame actually in the cells of our body and in the psyche because we're unwilling to express it. Like mm -hmm. that is the root of so much dis-ease you know, truly, you know, I think Paul Cech, who's a mutual friend, he calls all of these major diseases, like diseases of repression. Yeah. And repression is holding something in feeling that it's unworthy. It makes you unworthy. It makes you bad. And therefore you need to keep it secret, keep it safe, you know, and then fundamentally you'll never love yourself, nor will you allow the world to actually love you because what liberates you from that is expressing it and having somebody look at you and not flinch and be like, okay, I love you just the same, mm -hmm. even more for the courage to share that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, one thing that parents can do if they're doing it their best is no matter what, if, they, if the kid can look in their parents' eyes and see that they're loved no matter what they do, that will liberate them from this feeling of shame and allow them to actually express what they want to express. There's nothing that my son could ever do that would make me not want to love him or not want to spend time with him or not continue to work on myself so I can show up for him better. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing he could do. I mean, obviously if he was violent to me, if he was trying to stab me later on, you know, but I'm not gonna let that happen. He's gonna be a good kid. Yeah. But there's certain limits of this. And I, I was feeling when you were saying too, the opposite of depression. I've, I've had a lot of depression in my past, anxiety. I had a fucking bad episode last night. I should, we should talk about okay, that. Okay, let's talk about that. But, but, but the opposite, the opposite of depression is expression, you know, to, uh -huh. to piggyback on what you're saying about Paul. So if I'm expressing myself, we're in a world of people that are scared to express themselves 
And honestly, like the more we do that, the more we're going to heal as a society. Now, granted, when we first express ourselves, it might not be that good. <laughs> it might not be that great, right? You, you got to be willing to look stupid. And, and actually, like I'll do that for my son. When I learn new stuff, when he's able to understand what I'm learning, I'm just going to learn it and be honest about it and be like, hey, I'm kind of going to fumble around here, son, but I'm going for it. I'm yeah. fucking going for it yeah. no matter what. And I think that's beautiful. Truth because is always good. That's the, the thing. truth is always good. Truth is always good. Yeah. If you're just doing it and being honest, like it's always good. Truth. It's always good. Truth. This is the first cigar I've had in like three years. Yeah. I hope I'm doing it right. I mean, you could do it better, but you, <laughs> but the fact that you're doing it is is good. You know, yes, you're exactly. truly doing it exactly. as best as you know how now. Yeah, you know? man. Thanks for the cigar. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. You're welcome. I had an experience. Uh, I was on the phone and, you know, I recently released a podcast with Aaron Rodgers and people got to kind of a window to the depth of our friendship. And uh, I've had really deep friendships before in my life. It's not the first deep, really close friendship I've had. And I have other deep, close friendships, but um, it's just a particular resonance that we have as brothers that's really unique and interesting. And it's also a unique and interesting time in my life. Yeah. And uh, he was expressing some things to me and I was, I actually just came out of a ketamine cannabis journey that was fucking phenomenal. And really like, the, it really springs me That'll into my highest out. divine consciousness, you know? And I, so I was coming right out of that feeling as good as I could possibly feel, the highest vibration that I could possibly feel. And the, which is interesting to contrast with how low I felt last night. Mm. And there may be something there with like, I, I'm feeling both the highs and the lows more in, in this current chapter. But in any case, he's on the phone with me and I could tell he's a little bit ashamed of some things that he was thinking. And I just got this overwhelming feeling of like, and I just told him, I was like, bro, like there's not a fucking thing in the world that you could tell me that I would judge you for. Like nothing. And I actually thought about it in my head and I was like, is there? I was like, nope. Hmm. I mean, some things I might caution him against. Like if he was like, yeah, I feel like I want to stab my fucking teammate in the neck. I'd be like, cool, don't do it. Yeah. For sure, don't do it. But yeah. like, I wouldn't judge him for that. And of mm -hmm. course, it wasn't anything, and it wasn't anything extreme nor any issues with his team or anything like that. Everything's good. But like, it was this feeling of there's nothing I would possibly judge you for, no matter what, right now. And it was cool because I don't, I don't think I've felt that much before. You know, with men like, or just with people? With people in general, this yeah. pure unconditionality. I mean, I'm sure it's there to some degree with my mom, but in there, in a lot of relationships, it's easy to like slip into a little bit of judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I think because there's no attachment necessarily in the friendship, it's just like we're fucking friends. Yes, I don't, I don't need anything or expect anything. There's nothing that there's no contract or relational conditions that we have that could be violated or it was a very interesting experience that was recent and fresh and that's the type of energy i'd want to bring in to my children for sure yeah you know like and that's that's also the energy for sure to bring in to my union with vilana and like you know i've been there sometimes but i've certainly f found myself judging her yeah but the minute you put the penis and the vagina the minute there's penetration it changes everything right because the whole relationship you know intimacy i'm sure you've talked about this multiple times on your cast but into me you see mm -hmm. so i'm gonna see with carrie all of her stuff she's gonna taste and feel and have like a visceral somatic experience of all the things in me that aren't loving that are judgmental. And then we bounce the tennis ball back and forth. Right. And eventually we get to a place where we're improving. And I think, man, I mean, I don't know how you have this experience, but for me, this was like from day one, it was tumultuous. It was challenging. There's been super high highs and super low lows. And I think what that did for me was it just cracked a part of my heart wide open where I was like, okay, three months in, I knew this was the mother of my child. Mm -hmm. There was a feeling that I could, I can't sit here and tell you with words and use my intellect to say, oh, this is why I chose her. Or this yeah, is why she me. chose me. It there's was no, a choice, this choice. There's no possible way. And some yeah. of the things we can't, we can't put words on because it actually, it's like trying to define God. You know, we can, right. we can learn from Paul. We can sit here and go back and forth about everything and nothing at the same time. But until you hold a child in your arms, until you know God, until you've actually been in communion with God, 
there's no possible way you can understand it. And even from there, you probably couldn't say it right. You probably fuck up <laughs> a little yeah, bit. I mean, the description of it. It's always the that's always the curious thing when people ask, "Do you believe in God?" Like, I don't think God's supposed to be believed in. I think it's supposed to be known or not known. You know, if you're believing, there's a lot of room for manipulation. Mm. Know God. Get to know Him. Yeah, him, him. It's a ridiculous thing to say, right? But sure, get to know God. But it's a construct we understand, right? You know, Earth, so, the, Earth, the mom, God, the father. Yeah. So, but either way, we know that that's also false. That there is no genderlessness. There's no gender in the in the the all. But right, right. it is it is kind of helpful to use that because that in our mammalian construct, our lens, that's how we see it, and we can't see outside of story, anyways. Uh -huh. So as soon as we start to explain the thing, we're dipping into story because we're using words that carry meaning and connotations in our own perspective. But uh, but yeah, I mean, the, ultimately, it's like do you know god or not that's really the question mm -hmm. and it's not a matter of like faith or belief and i yeah. think that's where we've kind of gotten it gotten it wrong i always tell people god to me is not a bearded dude in the sky uh, there's no way that i could ever create that as a reality because i was raised in like a christian upbringing my mom was pretty religious um and so i was actually pissed off at god for a long time in my life right I was like, well, why can't, if God is all loving, omnipresent being, then why can't you heal my mom and where's dad? Yeah, you know, and, and why totally. am I experiencing so many challenges in the world? And honestly, it wasn't until like my 30s, like 33, 34, that I found God. I went three decades without knowing what God was. I mean, holding Nova is a whole different version of God, but actually knowing what God is, I experienced it through ceremony and through breath. And, and I think if you get to be in the state where you know and experience God and you get to hold your son in that, you know, in that transmission, then your son will know God from the start. And that's the thing that I think mm -hmm. I haven't seen much of really is, and it's not like I'm in contact with the, we're always in contact with the divine. We're always participating in the divine, but the, the vibration and the consciousness we're at fluctuates and it fluctuates in kind of pretty extreme ways for me you know, where I'm very much in my separate self, which can get very depressed, or I'm in my unified consciousness, which is the most alive, the most radically alive I could be. But I know that if I can bring my children in with me when I'm in that state and they could feel it and I could be, just look at them and be like, this is God, like this is God. Hmm. And like, just give them that feeling, hmm. like, this is God, this is God. It's like all the love you could ever feel. And God wants to know your story, every bit of it. It's the most important story in the world. And like give them that feeling, you know, that's starting, for, starting with that. And then say, and I am feeling that right now, but don't get confused. I'm not God. I am not God. God yeah. is everywhere and in everything and in you. Mm -hmm. And I'm just dipping my finger into the river in the current, in the stream that's everywhere. So don't ever get confused by when I'm angry or when I'm not like this or when I don't pay attention to you. Don't think that I'm God. Remember, this feeling is God and it's not me. And I think like clearing that and separating that is like so important. And I'm gonna start, those conversations are gonna start early, like early, trying mm -hmm. to disambiguate myself and mom from the divine father and mother and give them access to the actual divine father and mother through allowing them to step into the current of the emotions coming through us. And then eventually they'll have their own opportunity, probably start with breath work and then eventually move up through the medicine path through mm -hmm. initiations and vision quests and things like that. Yeah. Thank you for the quest, by the way. You're one of the people that, you were the, the person that introduced me to Tim Corcoran. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for two years, the past two years on the quest. And that was the most powerful medicine. I mean, there's no psychedelics needed when you're doing four days of fasting in nature. Wow. <laughs> like when yeah. you're when you're that deep in nature, I mean, I've had heart palpitations and experiences that are so psychedelic without any kind of medicine whatsoever that would actually some of my ayahuasca experiences could pale in comparison to the stuff that came through when I was out there in nature. Wow. Because you will face your fear. I mean, I know it's something that you've probably done at some point, right? Like fasting in nature. I don't know if you've done a quest with Tim, but I have it. But oh my God, I mean the the purity of nature that most people are trying to escape is because they don't know how to sit with themselves. And there's all this like flinching when when I first got out there, when people get out there, it's it's wild beyond anything I could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And 
um, one of the big things is that I realized that I was still attached to my father being a certain way. It's pretty cool to smoke a cigar here and talk with you about fatherhood. Yeah. Because I, I feel into the man that my father was and is, and he's an imperfect being. You know, I, I went through this experience where um, it's been 40, 40 years plus, 40 years of like trying to see him in a different way, hoping for the best. And really inside of me, there was this like young boy, this young wounded boy who was trying to actually make him something he wasn't. Yeah. I was trying to make him the father that was loving, the father that was present, the father that was there, you know, like a, almost like a dream, like a little movie reel I was playing in my brain at times, but it wasn't his movie. It's not who he is. Right. And so I had to come to terms with that out there. And I did this beautiful ceremony on like day three where I'm kind of trembly because your heart rate elevates when you fast like that. Mm -hmm. And I walked up on the side of the mountain and I, for people that don't know the vision quest, you go through three days of like hardcore ego stripping. So all the mass, all the thing that I show up with in regular life, that shit's gone right away because Tim and Mark are very talented at doing that. And we got to this place where I really just had a lot of rage and anger at my father and it was eating at me. Like literally it was eating at my physicality, it yeah, was eating, sure. eating at my soul. And I, um, I sat on the top of the mountain and I thought about like the father I'm going to be for Nova. And if I'm still at, in my forties, if I'm still trying to make my father someone he's not, that's dangerous for my own relationship with my son, because then I'm going to kind of like almost subsequently give that to him, that energy. Mm. So I got to this place where I, I actually found this crazy bone. It was like a bone with like meat still on it. And I went down uh, and I sat in my site and I, I just did a little ceremony and I was like, Hey, you know, I love you, dad. I love you. I really do. Like there's a part of my heart that will always love you no matter what, because you gave me the gift of life. Mm -hmm. There's nothing really else that you are required to do. I mm -hmm. could have demands or expectations of you, but you gave me life. So thank you. And that's it. And so I, I buried him. I buried the bone. I did a ceremony and um, had a conversation with my grandfather. I mean, this is the psychedelics that you can experience without medicine in the nature. And the other, the other way, which is the way that I that I went, is the darkness, the dark room. You know, the dark yes. retreat. It's which is similar in that all the ego stripping, all of the things that you thought were, you know the important which is all the external world all of it points directly inward because there's no escape and there's nothing there no distractions that's it's just you and the black and in the void that seems so scary to me i'm like i saw that and i was like i don't know if that calls <laughs> i don't know if i want to do that like vision quest is hardcore being in the dark on, do you fast in the dark as well you could we were on a like a raw vegan we were on like a raw vegan diet. Well, that's basically fasting. Yeah, it was, uh, I didn't eat a lot. <laughs> I didn't eat a lot. Um, but it was, so you could, and fasting would add just another layer of intensity to it. Mm. Uh, and I'm definitely drawn to go back, but so much so that I put a dark room in my house. So I'll go do small, like one day, one day journeys or six hour immersions in the dark and mm. just like get, get back into the black and uh <laughs> in one of those in one of those kind of ceremonies i went in and it, i called it a death lodge and it was part of that was saying goodbye to my father because my father's mm -hmm. so for those of you who don't know i haven't talked about it much you know i had a i had a really good relationship with my father you know we our challenges as i said rage and some different conditionality of love and he had a lot of his own struggles and challenges but his struggles and challenges you know, led him to explore psychedelic medicine and introduced him to Stan Groff and the whole, you know, crew, the OG crew. And they were the ones who led me on my first psychedelic vision quest when I was 18, my rite of passage that then sent me on my whole life. So if it wasn't for my father's struggles and his quest to seek things out, he wouldn't have led me down this path. So everything was mm. perfect, you know, and so much gratitude for that. And then at, at 30, um, he started to get, you know, more he kept trying to connect to voices that would come through and in his mind it was like voices of the angels you know was, that was where his his mind and his desire like schizophrenic was, or he was trying he was yeah. trying to connect to that and then it seemed like just kind of like an eccentricity at the time um but 
at one point the voices started to come and there was starting to be warning signs that these voices were not angels they were a projection an externalized projection of the ego talking back to him but we still didn't because we didn't understand the the, the potential consequences of what how this could pathologically unfold we didn't like raise the raise the red flag we were just like all right this is dad being a little eccentric and then it just it flipped and it was the voices were telling him the truth about reality and his heart and his senses and everybody else around him was false and so that thing flipped and uh and my family got really scared and um you know i tell this story very emotionally in the in the documentary awake in the darkness um because a lot of stuff with my father came up there as well but uh it just flipped and i had to you know go over to my family's house and they he was really unglued and scarily so you know and uh called the called the police and had to let them in the house and had to you know see them come in and um you know restrain my father you know like they had to use a like a stun gun or a taser and like take him take him away and that was like a fucking crazy thing and again i'm i'm not going into it with the full emotional gravitas that i could you know just because i don't feel like this is the place that i want i want to dive into the to the gravitas of that but in the in the show i in the documentary i certainly let myself feel it for the full to the full extent because it was i mean to describe what that is like to see this man that i've looked up to my whole life you know in this state and have to go through that was unbelievable but it's been a very strange situation because then from there on he was in and out of psychiatric Mm. care which the mental health the mental health care in our country is just kind of ridiculous they're overwhelmed underfunded and there's not really that much they can do you know so Mm -hmm. and he was clever enough and sovereign enough that he could get himself out but once he was out he just barred himself from everybody because you know so basically he's been in isolation and and we many people have tried his brother myself his best friend we've all tried to like reach him but he won't allow himself to be reached he's just kind of in his own world so it's been strange because i've had to say goodbye to my father um without having a funeral he's still Hmm. quote alive yeah but he's dead but then he may he may you know resurrect himself he may go last like go and like who knows like there's so many possibilities of how it could go so there's not really a roadmap to that that i've known from anybody else who i've talked to but the same qualities have applied grief letting go Mm -hmm. you know saying goodbye saying goodbye to what was and i just went through that whole process and i feel very at peace after you know going through that whole grieving process and allowing myself to feel everything and writing the letters of goodbye and burning them and and going the rituals but some part of me also knows that maybe the chapter's not done and maybe there's more there for me to do um and i think probably doing that and making sure before i have kids too like you got to make sure that if there's if there's anything left to do that i've done it mm-hmm. you know and i'm oh. not just deluding myself and kidding yeah. myself into thinking like no i'm good because i feel like that but i don't know in order to do that though you had to have mass courage yeah there's no way you could have said all right i love you dad i'm letting you go yeah unless you were courageous enough to talk to the little boy inside and say hey i got you i can actually father you now yeah just because we were brought into this world with a certain construct it's not the totality of who you are of who of who i am right but there's an emotional journey to get there yeah there's no way that i could have that realization or that you had that realization just by flicking a light switch like people say oh love and forgiveness you know just forgive just love just forgive i don't buy that i don't think forgiveness and love is a is a light switch that you flick i think you have to go through like like you have and like i have there's this kind of tumultuous journey where it's like one layer unfolding and then you think you're healed and then you might go into a journey or you might have an experience where you realize where i've realized um yeah it's still there so i I was feeling when you were sharing that i'm like 
is he 100% healed? Like, are you 100% in total peace and surrender of the process? Because for me, there's probably a thread way back in there mm. where I'm like, yeah, if he comes back around, I would welcome him with open arms, mm -hmm. total open arms. I mean, obviously our situations are different. Like, I don't, I don't know what it's like to have been through what you've been through. Sure. I mean, I was my, my heart was like, I felt like there was a gate around my heart that was squeezing it when you were talking. Like that's that's painful. And would you be who you are? <laughs> right. Would we be truly? Would we be who we are if these things didn't occur? Like it's painful and it's perfect, yeah. which is such a fucked up paradox at times. I'm like, huh? We're on a show talking about our lives here in Austin. Like, okay, I'll play this game. But it's it's truly a game, and sometimes I allow the pain in me or the the feelings that I have of grief to to make me forget that I'm in a game. Mm -hmm. I'm not spiritually bypassing. I'm I'm, be, I'm being honest. Like sometimes I'm in total joy, and then sometimes these emotions that I experience, this grief, even as a father, I um I don't know what to do with them all the time. You know, yeah. I have some good tools, I have some great tools, but I think there's just something to be said about like you never know what's going to happen in the ocean. Yeah. You know, in the ocean of forgiveness, like there's going to be times where you hit a fucking squall <laughs> you may not have known was coming. And, and that's definitely been the case, man. Through my crazy travel schedule, I have learned that I want to travel light and effective. And one of the best ways to do that is to travel with all of Onnit's instant collection. Alpha Brain Instant, New Mood Instant, Hydra Tech. It's super easy. All you do is you tear off the little strip here you pour it in water and you get the instant effects of these formulas that we worked on for a decade. Formulas that I don't want to leave home without that can help in the case of Alpha Brain, get you more focused, put you in this productive flow so you can get the shit done that you want to get done. And of course, New Mood to help you relax, stay calm, stay centered. It's the great yin yang of the Onnit formulas. And of course, Hydratech, anytime you're sweating, working out hard, all of these are available onnit.com slash Aubrey, and you'll save 10%. Once again, that's onnit.com slash Aubrey. I think the key thing is, is to really remove all of the divinity that you've placed on your parents, you know, and not, not that they aren't divine, of course they are, but like that they don't represent God to you anymore. It's, you know, my, so my, and even the name father it carries so much weight and it's like such a big deal in our world, you know, and, and it is a big deal and yeah. it's not. And it's, he's, yeah, he's my dad. He's also Michael Marcus. He's Michael Marcus. And Michael Marcus has his own challenges and struggle. He has the, you know, he had his own porn that he liked to watch and he had his own fucking whatever. Like he's a, he's a human. He's just a dude. Also, you know, like, and I think we forget that, you know, it's like when we have all of these expectations and labels, again, that's what makes it so hard to love unconditionally is because we have all of these expectations. Like, you're my father. How could you have done this? Like, yeah. Whereas if it's just another person, you're like, well, you know, they had their own shit. They were dealing with it. You know, but when it, when we put these labels on somebody, it makes it such a big deal. And, and then also society reinforces that it's such a big deal, you know, like, about your family, your family, your family is like, okay, yeah, it can be, and it is important, but also you can choose your family mm -hmm. and that's okay too. You know, yeah. you can, and doesn't mean you have to, you know, exile your, your birth family from your life. Of course not love them and respect them for everything yes. they offered you, but it, it also doesn't mean it has to be such a fucking big deal. There is this pressure that I think many of us feel where because we're born into a bloodline, we have to love no matter what, that bloodline. And it's just not the case. Mm -hmm. If I have a friend in my life or a colleague that treats me like garbage and I let them know the healthy bright line boundary and they continue to not honor that boundary, I say goodbye. And I think we can apply yeah. that same thing to parents. It, there's no reason that you have to keep going back to the well and drinking the poison. There's yeah. just no reason for that. Yeah. It's just not, it's not reality, but it, but it is a reality for people that are stuck in this construct of like, I got to be the good little boy, mm -hmm. the good little girl and do what mommy and daddy say. And then that actually goes out to what we're experiencing as a society right now, which is where I got to listen to the CDC. I got to listen to what's coming <laughs> down for mandates. Sure. And it's just this other layer of fear. It's like a, it's like a fear cyclone. And I just want no part of it. <laughs> I want yeah. Nova to have no part of it. 
And so I'm stoked that we're here because I know so many people are going to feel this like, God, what are the things in my life that I'm doing because I was told to do versus what my soul, my gut is telling me to do. I think a lot of people are clouded by yeah. the intellect. We've made the intellect this like God that we get drunk on all the time. And it's the, it's the conditioned collective intellect that's not even ours. We didn't even come up with it. It's just exactly. something that we've like just downloaded from osmosis from yeah. a billion different sources in the world. And it's it's so funny how, and you mentioned the CDC and, and all of this, and it's so funny to me how different people's sentiments are towards COVID now. Like COVID's still around. Yeah. People are getting it all the time. And it's like, everybody's like, meh. And I was like, do y'all realize how fucking crazy y'all were like a year exactly. ago? Do you, do you, are you, do you forget? You remember when you double masked in the car alone? <laughs> yeah. Like and now it's no big deal. Like, like what is, but it seems like it's unacknowledged <laughs> the difference, you know, it's like kind of like, but to me, I'll look around and be like, y'all, it's what, what, like, what is, what is going on here? Yeah. Do you, do you not realize like this is, this attitude that you have now is an attitude that you were shaming, ridiculing, attacking, canceling people for the same attitude that you're expressing right now in mm. the same or similar conditions is the same thing you were attacking people for like a year ago. You know, like it's just, it's very odd to me. Well, I think when you point out a fallacy and someone's subconscious has been so attached to it, there's a massive, almost like a <laughs> expectation hangover that Christine talks about. Like I expected things to be a certain way and now they're not, okay, I'm just going to bury that. Yeah. It's I'm just, just like going to bury it and intentionally like intentionally not talk about it in amnesia, but we all know it's there. And that's the part where like, I've, I've really had to walk a ladder on the whole theater. I call it COVID theater because mm -hmm. it's like a really bad play that we're all watching. Yeah, for sure. I've had to walk the, the emotional ladder. Like there was a time where when 2020 first came around, that was why we moved to Texas, man. We moved to Texas because Carrie and I were looking at a sunset in San Diego and, sh and she had just gotten pregnant with Nova. And this cop rolls up on us and he's like, hey, you need to wear a mask if you're out here. And I actually thought he was joking. I was, I was like, whatever. And he's like, no, seriously, you, you have to wear a mask. And I'm just, in my mind, I'm like, it just didn't register. Like yeah. full somatic experience of fuck you. Yeah. Like you're not going to tell me to wear a mask when I'm watching a sunset with my woman. And then yeah. that night we went home and we said, where are we going to live? Because <laughs> yeah. it ain't going to be here. And unfortunately, when I came to Texas, there was still some of that downtown. I mean, sure. we live in hill country, so not necessarily up there as much, but I was fascinated. I was so shocked. I'm like, if Texas is one of the most free places where there's really like, you know, don't tread on me energy, mm -hmm. then w what's it like in places like New Hampshire or super, I guess you could Which say- Which is odd for, odd for you to mention New Hampshire since their state motto is live free or die. Okay. And, I don't like the they, labels either. And, of like, they, and they, and they d like didn't probably practice they did that, not. <laughs> that motto. I hate these labels of like red and white conservative and all this stuff. I think it's, I think it's tools to divide us. I don't, Absolutely. I don't, I vote with my actions, with my money, with my heart. I don't actually like participate in the voting game. Mm -hmm. People might judge me for that, but whatever. The reason I'm saying that is because God, if I'm, if I'm experiencing that in California and some here in Texas, you and I have no idea. We live in a bubble sometimes. You see more, maybe a little bit more of the world than I do. You travel probably a lot more. But oh my God, if we are in a bubble where everybody is talking about freedom for our family, for ourselves, imagine what the fuck it's like in different cities across America where the only narrative, the only narrative is fear. The only narrative is do what you're told, watch the screen and handle it that way. I mean, and that's, that just and that's blows where me away. And that's also where the compassion comes in because you realize like, fuck, you know, like it, there's so, there's so much conditioning, so much fear, so much lack of feeling of safety. People just didn't feel safe. And yeah. when you don't feel safe, you do everything you can to make yourself feel safe. And I think, you know, part of that safety that comes in, I mean, beyond Republican, Democrat, all of these other kind of arbitrary lines that we've been forced into because of the collective system that we have, which I think is absolute nonsense. You know, and I would never consider myself either one of those, you know, like. You're not a Trumper? <laughs> fuck no. <laughs> I mean, like. I got labeled the, a Trumper when I moved here. Of course, of course, you, of course you do. Yeah. Everybody wants to put you into a camp one way or another. You know, like when I was talking about psychedelics, I was like the most liberal hippie fucking piece of shit of all time. And then I'm like, maybe chill out on all of the, you know, lockdowns. And I'm like, you fucking 
queue adjacent. I'm like, what the fuck are y'all talking about? Yeah. I just have opinions, you know? And like, that's the, that's like the, the crazy reality that we've been in where everybody's so desperate to put you in one tribe or another so that they can, you know, basically judge you and then discard you or scapegoat you mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's just not the way. And it's not the, it's not the truth. I even felt it right now. I had to check myself because I was getting heated as I was expressing to you. And I'm like, okay, sometimes sacred anger is good. Like I would never let somebody hurt my son or hurt my family. I wouldn't just be blase and passive to that. But then, you know, one thing I've been feeling into is what line do we draw for ourselves in society when it comes to people telling you and I what we do with our bodies and how we lead our lives? It's such a moving target at times. Like it brings me to this place where I have sometimes massive rage and then mm. sometimes grief because I know not everybody can come with us. And it's not like I'm better. I'm not sitting here like on some totem pole saying like, oh, I know the way, but I definitely feel the way. I feel the way of like, when it feels light to my body, when it feels free for my soul, that's the way. Yeah. The, the other way isn't the way, no matter how much we try to compartmentalize it or intellectualize it. And I think it's just this game of safety that we're playing. Like I'm here with you right now. There's nothing in this life that's 100% safe. There's no fucking way we could ever be totally safe. It's just not possible. No. And and which, is, which is makes it so good. And if you actually recognize the unborn, undying aspect of our infinite self as connected to the divine, then paradoxically, we're always safe, mm. right? And that's, I think, the, the defining factor of... So, and where I was going with the last kind of rant, but I forgot actually where I was going, but the defining factor that I've seen in people's reaction to COVID was not Republican, Democrat. I mean, there's some correlations I suppose you could make with those particular camps, but I try to disregard those camps entirely altogether. But the number one defining factor was have, has a person faced off with their mortality in a significant way? Like, have they looked, stared into the abyss of their own death and accepted that reality truly, fully, somatically and come back from the other side, you know, a stronger person from that? Yeah. And if they had done that, then they weren't scared and they felt safe, right? And that's, that was the number one correlative characteristic. And that could have been the plant medicine path, which is how I've done it. It could have been... You know, this person walked across, this is kind of, I don't want to, walked across a very cold place all alone, <laughs> you know, like, or been in some very challenging combat situations, yeah. you know, where places where they've had to like deal with their death. And at the point where they've de dealt with and accepted and moved beyond their understanding of their death, like that, yeah, we're going to die. Memento mori, like we're going to die. Like that truly in, a, in an embodied way was the, was the number one correlative to whether people felt safe or not. Mm. So you never experienced like the rage or the fear or you did, but it was quick. I, I felt a stifling suffocation when I wouldn't express what I really wanted to say. Yes. That's what I felt. And, and so I eventually released a poem, um, you know, I think a time for a revolution and and it was like a revolution of consciousness not of action but of like a way to rethink about our place in the world and what yeah. it means and how we're allocating resources and how you know with the money that we spent to pay for the lockdowns we could have ended world hunger and provided clean water for the entire world like 12 times over or something like that so there was there was that there was some sacred anger that was coming up through that but the biggest thing that i experienced was feeling shut down suffocated like yeah. I wasn't able to speak because I remember early on I made a post basically saying like I miss gathering together. I miss being at concerts and hugging someone and seeing a stranger next to me. And I miss being at Burning Man and sharing a puff of mapacho with somebody on the playa. And and then like it was just an expression of my heartfelt desire to be in communitas. And then I just got fucking lit up for that. Like, how could you even be thinking about that right now? About Like, just so much mm. venom that yeah. came to me for that. And that that is like, it's this very, it kind of shut me down a little bit from, from expressing what I really felt. Because I, I did, I missed, I missed people. I missed gathering. I missed, like, 
I missed it. And that's all I just, that's all I wanted to say, you know, fundamentally was I fucking missed this so much, mm-hmm. you know, and, and to be attacked for that, then I was like, well, fuck, I just can't say anything. And so I retracted and I would just talk about other subjects that were safe. And, uh, until I started becoming like more outspoken, I felt like I was, I had something, I was like, tr- I had a paper bag or a plastic bag over my head. Yeah. I felt that in a big way. And I was actually shocked at how many people didn't speak. I was like, oh, you're all just kind of complying now. But there's so many people that have like massive platforms, like millions of people follow these people. What if, what if we were all just to speak our truth and even in the fear of judgment and just go for it and we could lose revenue, we could lose followers, we could lose whatever, how powerful that would be, how amazing that would be. And I really feel like we called this in. I feel like the COVID theater and all this stuff, we, we welcomed it in as a collective because there's a part of us, we're still kind of like a teenager in society. <laughs> we're still learning how to like drive the Ferrari. Sure. We've been given a Ferrari here. This is the most beautiful experience. Like look at all the stuff we get to do all the time. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing. So epic. But we are behind the wheel and we're kind of like, what, what would happen if you gave a, a Ferrari to a 13 year old? They'd probably fucking crash it. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of there. And I feel like God, the archetype of the father, whatever you want to say, is teaching us. I feel like you and I are on a page in a book and we're just doing the best we can to honor all the people that are going to be written on the page after us. That's it. Mm -hmm. I used to feel when I would wake up in the morning, I'm like, I got to grow my audience. I got to, I would put this pressure on myself all the time. And it was exhausting. And I was like, oh, I'm actually doing that because my ego doesn't want to fully express itself. So I'm going to get caught up and overwhelmed and all this other stuff where I'm trying to quote, save the world. But meanwhile, I'm not tending to the full world in me. I'm I'm not actually taking care of all of my world. And that was like the, I mean, that was double bomb drop on the quest but definitely in every ceremony I've ever done. The last ayahuasca ceremony was like the rip cord of me jumping out of the plane where I knew I would never go back. Mm. Um, it was down at a place in Costa Rica. I think we know the, the name of that place. And so just, I'm not going to name their name just because I used to consult with them and I don't want to mm-hmm. slander them, but not every space is sacred. Not yep. every ceremony is sacred. I just did a podcast with Ben Greenfield. I don't know if you know this. He's come out against plant medicine. He's, he's no longer a proponent of plant I've medicine. Yeah. And so I wanted to bring him on and I'm like, well, tell me the real story. Like what's, what's really going on? And at the core of it, he said that it came to him from scripture, that there was this pharmacia conversation he had with himself. But I feel like it was something deeper. And I, I tried the best I could to like really get it out. But I think Ben in this limelight of, of sharing like, okay, I'm done with medicine. But then at the very end, he changes to, and he's like, well, I have, I, there, maybe there's certain cases. There are certain cases where this medicine can be powerful. This medicine can be healing. And I, I feel the same way. I feel like medicine can harm or it can heal from my own experience. Mm-hmm. I had to go through the darkest night of the soul around porn. 20 years plus porn ruled my fucking life. And even when I got with Carrie and I knew it was coming, I was like, I have to let this go somehow. How am I going to let go of porn? I like literally didn't know how I was going to do it. Yeah. And I just, I go into therapists and talk therapy and EMDR and all this stuff. Because for me, like it wasn't a drug for me. Like I, I used to smoke and drink and all that stuff, but porn was so like viscerally embedded in my psyche where mm-hmm. when I didn't want to do something or when life got really hard, I would go to porn. It's an escape. It's an escape. Yeah. But it was actually ayahuasca where ayahuasca showed me what my life would be like if I were to continue to be a slave to porn. Yeah. And that was like the ultimate. However, there was some dark energy that came in. So I I understand what Ben is saying. Like it's not 100% safe. And I'm not sitting here saying that everybody should do plant medicine, but I think there's a, a, a more sacred ramp, like a sacred on ramp to do medicine. Cause a lot of people that go to medicine, they could end up like an experience that I had and they might not fucking come back. They might actually go through a, a unique it's a trial by fire. Shatter. It's a trial by fire and yeah. you don't go straight into the hottest part of the fire before you, you dip in the waters. It's like, don't go into the lava until you know you're made of dragon. <laughs> yes. You know, like be made of dragon before you go fucking into the dragon fire for yeah. sure. Yeah. And test yourself every step of the way. And I've been tempted to make that kind of escalation pathway and I always talk about it, but it, 
I never will tell someone to go do medicine until like, well, have you been in a float tank? Right. How many times? Like at least like at least six to ten times in a float tank before even thinking about it. Have you been in shamanic breath work? Okay, like go take that. Not just like some Wim Hof breathing before mm-hmm. your cold plunge, which is great. Like go fucking deep. You know, like go there. Like go to all try go all of these places first. And then if you still feel called after starting to unpack that, then fucking go for it. You know what I mean? But there's it is important to let people know like there's many, many pathways and you don't need medicines. Yes. You know, like people will ask me, like, do I need ayahuasca? I was like, no, of course not. You probably want some significant changes in your life and potentially ayahuasca could be one of those tools, but you don't need it. You don't know it's not a matter of need. Yeah. You know, in certain cases it can be really helpful, but there's many, many ways up the mountain. And so never feel compelled to do anything on the plant medicine path. However, also don't feel a compulsory negativity towards it because of some strange interpretation of scripture. Mm-hmm. You know, like I don't know how you have herbal remedies in your tinctures and supplements, but these particular herbs are somehow the the devil ones and these ones are the god ones like that whole concept to me is fucking bonkers yes all respect to all respect to ben and those who believe it but that doesn't make any doesn't make any sense fundamentally to me but also at the same time like if you don't want to do them for sure don't do them i think it's awesome that he's out in public with one of the biggest podcasts out there sharing his experience so we can all learn from it like he's trying to find the middle way all of us are i mean Lao Tzu, it's easy for me to quote Lao Tzu and be like, oh yeah, the middle, the middle path, the middle way is the way. My mind gets that, but my body still tries to figure it out. My body is always like, what, it, what exactly is the middle way? What is the middle way for Ben? What is the middle way for you and I? And how can we like, I think we talked about this earlier, just I'm going to fumble through it. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to fumble through it so that eventually I do find the middle way, but it's not something that I think we get right out the gate. The middle mm-hmm. way is like, the, the, it feels like a moving target. It's like a Goldilocks zone that I'm always trying to live my life through, but it's never the same any day. The, what the middle way is trying to say is that the truth, it's the true, it's the true way. And the true way is often in the middle. However, it's not always in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also a trap to finding the middle way. Sometimes the true way can be very fucking extreme. You know, like sometimes the right thing to do is to defend your life with lethal force. It's not a middle way. Yeah. It's like that is the that is the right thing to do at this point because it's either kill or be killed. Someone breaks into your house and they got a gun and they're they come with lethal intent. Like there's no middle way. There's a way. Yeah. You know, and that's the and that's the reality of that situation. So I think it's like a general maxim that's usually helpful, especially if you're mediating a discussion, you know, like assuming that there's a truth that's in between. Sometimes though. One person is just honestly expressing the truth and the other person's fucking lost it. Like I've been in those situations, I mediate a lot of different conversations because in- intuitively I can find the truth in between, which is often in the middle. But I've been in some where I'm like, yep, like pretty much the sounds like you got it right on the nose, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and there's maybe some fine points, but it's really about the truth. Like where is where is the truth? And and then then you get into the ideas about the objectivity or subjectivity. I was of truth, literally just gonna say that. Like, which is who's truth? The yeah. truth that we all like if I drop this cigar, there's gravity. But who's to say that the way you lead your life is the truth or the way I lead my life is the truth? I mean, we could pontificate that so many ways. Well, that's far too much of a fucking amount of time to actually say anything's in the truth because we're always dancing between uh, yes. truth and delusion and dis- distortion i mean we're coming into a, i'm coming into awareness of my own distortion fucking constantly you know i did a recent exercise <laughs> to excavate shame i wouldn't have thought i was yeah. ashamed of anything anymore and then i go to excavate go through this process to like uncover my shame plex as rabbi gaffney calls it and go you know complete this exercise and i'm like holy shit i'm ashamed of like so much still you know after all of these after all of this work and all of these years and i started wrote wrote out my own shameography and just understanding it so of course there's an infinite amount to learn um but there are certain cases where things map to what a general consensus objectivity 
of reality would be. And that's yeah. what our courts are trying to get to. They don't always get to, but that's the idea. The idea is that there is some justifiable right or wrong that somewhere at least maps a little bit more closely to reality. Like, for example, as much as people might want to believe that men can have a baby and we have a male baby emoji, yeah, it's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. So that's not a truth. Now, in a, from a metaphysical perspective, can a man birth a work of art that lives and grows from the womb of his creativity in his divine feminine? Yes. But his belly's not going to get distended. <laughs> you yes. know, like it's not going to be another human life that comes out. You know, and so it is this balance between subjectivity and ob objectivity for sure. There's no way that I'm going to be part of a world or a narrative that is contributing to dysphoria of any kind, specifically yeah. gender. And I think it comes in like a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm not here to like be against the transgender movement at all. Of course not. But live I your life. am. Exactly. If you want to do something, great. But when you living your life, you want me to use specific language, specific way of being, and you want me to believe something is real when it's not. I mean, that, that is actually like a hallmark of communism. Well, it's, right? I'm going to tell you a truth, it's, but yeah. it's not the actual truth. It's post-modernity to its, to its most illogical conclusion, which is everything is a story. There is nothing that's real. And if everything's a story and there's nothing that's real, then, then men can have babies. Yes. It's like, so, and, and that's obviously, we know that that's not true, right. you know, so there's, another transcendent and it's good to actually so it's good to include that and understand as you were saying like well fuck everything is subjective and there's an objective first principles first values there's a real cosmos and real earth and real things yeah. and it's both it's like we have to both include the post-modernity of there's infinite amounts of genders that people can express yes and there's infinite ways that you could imagine birth and creation, but there's only one way that it's actually going to happen with the body, you know? So it's, yeah. it's the balance of both. It's an including and transcending. And I think we're still stuck in this place where we're, we haven't transcended this idea of everything being subjective. I get why there's this movement for people to put she, her, they, them. I think there's a hundred, over 150 pronouns and there now there's like these neo pronouns. Have you seen the neo pronoun conversation. I tend not so, to follow it. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't spend I think a lot of time there. I think. I think. And I've said this before. I think there's eight billion genders, eight billion unique genders, and they are well summarized by just calling someone by their name. Cool. You know I what I mean? That. Like yes. Yeah, for sure. You're yes. not a man or a woman. You're a billion other things. Actually, yeah. so I actually could never even get it accurate by any label. So how about we just go with name? You know, like yeah. How about that? Like that, that that's great. That's, a, that's really the only thing that makes sense to me because I think they're right. Sure. If you don't feel like a, a man doesn't work for you, then there's another one, but no label is really going to work for you because you're fucking irreducibly unique, completely irreducibly unique. So I think the, the impulse to make 150 is right. They're just stopping too early. You got to go all the way to <laughs> 8 billion and at yes. 8 billion, you've got it right. And then at that point, you're like, well, fuck it. Might as well just go back to two. It's a lot easier to communicate. Wow. Talk about finding the middle way. Holy shit. I'm, I'm thinking about like, I get both sides. I get the empathetic side because I see why people are being compassionate, having empathy for people that in my opinion, right? This is just my opinion. This is not the objective truth. I think, well, it is objective truth for me. Um, I think that we care about each other. I think that I want people to feel accepted. I want of course. somebody to feel safe in their body, at home in their body. And- there's a limit to us having empathy and also truly calling out mental health disorders. Like true gender dysphoria, a, a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a, a 13-year-old, a young child that like, they don't even get to pick their dinner, but we're gonna try to say that they can pick their gender. That doesn't make sense to me. And that's not from a judgment place. That's more from like, okay, my curiosity is very fascinated by the way that our society is describing that all is welcome, all is good, all is here, all is accepted, no matter how crazy it is, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make rational sense to me, to my mind, or even to my heart. Right. Like my heart, my heart, I forget about the mind. My heart knows what's going on is we're still learning how to play. Yeah. <laughs> we're still learning how to be and in the sandbox and, that's, I and think, understand that's, each other. I think other. the meta framework that, that to me, like if I had a kid who was like, if I had a boy and it was like, dad, I feel like a woman, you know? 
And I would, my advice, if I'm going down into the real practical, would be like, okay, um, well, just know that lots of things are shifting and you're welcome to try this on. Yeah. Like, try it on, see what you think, see how it feels, like, I'll respect you. Would you buy your son a dress? Sure, sure. You know, if, if, this, if I felt like this was coming from not because his, he saw something on TV or his friends, but if this was a genuine thing, I'd yeah. be like, let's try this on, but just know that we're, we're trying this on and playing and playing. We're going to play this, play this out. And we're in the constant questioning and exploration and curiosity. And don't worry if, however, if it stays like this forever, great. If it shifts, okay. You know, but I think that's, that would be generally where I was, was just to put a meta framework of let's be real curious and also the radical acceptance, because I think. The problem would be is if he actually, through his own desire, because lots of kids want to dress up in women's clothes, yeah, you know, and like put on lipstick and just see what it's like. If the parent shames you in that moment and it's an expression of your life force and here I am radically alive and the parent's like, no, then all of a sudden you get shamed. And when your aliveness is shamed, then part of your goodness, which is related to your aliveness, is shamed as well. And then you carry that shame with you. So- I would be really mindful to just allow this to go through. And, and it's like most mental stuff that people go through, instead of trying to like fix it immediately, let's just trust that it's a season and a current. Mm -hmm. and like, okay, here we are. I love you. I love you just as you are in this space and I'm here to support you. And trust that this is a season and stay curious and stay open to the evolution of yourself through time. There, there's so much nuance. I mean, I love the way you put that. That, that was poetry. And there's so much nuance there. Mm -hmm. Like if I, if, I am, if I am being in agreement with maybe some psychosis that my child is having or some dysphoria that my child is having, yeah, if my son really wanted to, to have a dress, I'd probably buy him a dress too. I'd be like, hey, it's, you're expressing yourself. But if I saw, I have to be very careful about yeah. who he hangs out with sure. and who's around him Correct. and what YouTube is telling him. So there's there's so much, like, yes, there's a, <laughs> there's a true bifurcation there, but within that is so many little tennis matches back and forth. And I think that's like the challenge that, you know, we're here smoking cigars, right? Like I'm, this is my well, father's okay, well, cigar. Let's get, let's get real, let's get real. This is a very interesting one because porn is ubiquitous now. It was difficult to that's find right. when we were kids, you know, and I'm a little older than you. So it's probably easier for you. I'm than 42. Me. No way. Come you on. You did a good job, bro. Thank you. Thank you. You're older than me. Come on. Look at you go. Let's do it. I'm fucking impressed. Thank you. Youthful spirit. Yes. All right. So when we were kids. I love wellness. Yeah. <laughs> but you're <laughs> living it. Uh, so when we were kids, porn was hard to find. You know, you get a magazine. Yeah. And you share it with your closet, buddies. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. You know. It was hard. Or you hoard it like a selfish prick like I did. I didn't There was share always shit. like the secret box. <laughs> you had a like, secret box. Yeah. I got some. You got none? Suck it. You know, like I didn't care. No, that's, that's not true. I probably shared. But fundamentally, <laughs> like it was difficult at that point to you know to find it now it's ubiquitous yes and actually what you did find at that point was like a playboy or something or it's like maybe you could score a penthouse or something like that and like holy shit and your whole body would be lit on fire now it's a fucking different game and like so we have to address it yeah and i think as both you and i know there's there's a very kind of you can tell by the aftertaste of the porn that you consume that some particular types of porn you get a really gnarly poisonous aftertaste after you're done and then there's some there's some that yeah. like especially when you're really using fantasy and there's certain situations you're like actually that was pretty cool yeah you know like that felt pretty good so i don't it's i think it's dangerous to lump all public erotica into the same category and call it porn. I think there's a whole spectrum. But anyways, our kids are going to be wide open to the whole fucking spectrum. <laughs> and we're going to be, they're going to be drawn just like we were to public erotica. So how to deal with that is the interesting question. And I have some thoughts, mm. you know, and I've been, I've been really kind of curious about this, but I think when I have kids, it's going to become even more interesting because- I have some thoughts. Okay, yeah, that's that's what I want to get to. I have some big thoughts on that. Let's go. So after two decades of using porn, any addiction, no matter what, you have to keep uh, ramping up to get the same dopamine hit. The limbic brain needs to be satisfied. Right. So we get to this place where I did. I was watching some really gross shit. Yeah. And I mean, this is like three years ago. So 
Thank you to Plant Medicine. Thank you to Breathwork. Thank you to Paul Check. Like truly, I mean, honestly, like I really feel like those things healed me. But when I was in the depths of addiction, like way down in there, I was watching the worst things you could imagine. And like you said, I would almost have this like nausea as I was watching it and after I watched it. And I realized that it was because there was some part of me that I was at war with actually being responsible. I knew that my mission, my podcast, my future woman, I didn't have a woman at the time. It's, it's easy for men specific. I'll speak for men because I don't know what it's like to be a woman. Men, we, we get easily wired into porn because it's visceral. Like we have balls. We, we like to orgasm. Like this is a very different thing. Like men and women are different in that way. Well, they're I different, particularly, I think what you can certainly say, it's not a matter of desire. I think that's actually been proven categorically incorrect, especially by like Wednesday Martin's book on true and the, the whole revolution, the sexual feminine revolution is to reclaim the desire, like the Lilith that has been made a she demon because of her sexual desire to be equal in, in to Adam in her, in her sexual veracity and intensity has been then demonized. And then women's sexuality has been demonized. And now there's a big reclamation of that. I think that's there. However, one thing that is definitely true as far as i understand it from the literature is that men are more visually stimulated yes like we, what we see is actually what allures us more so than women who are interested more in story or sensation there's a warm up or, or, or like there's yeah. a whole other thing that it's not just purely visual visual like the visual has been over indexed indexed really high for men as compared to women in the aggregate. Now, this is all obviously different. I think 25% of Pornhub watchers are, are women now. So it's not like women aren't stimulated visually. Of course they are. But I think statistically in the aggregate, men are more enticed by the visual. And I think Aaron Alexander was just talking to me about a beetle in a, a beetle in Australia that's attracted visually to their mate. It's like a, like a golden orange beetle that's attracted visually to their mate. But that a, an empty beer bottle actually appears to them like what allures them to mate. And so they've almost gone extinct because they just swarm around the tops of beer bottles and just like do whatever fucking insect ejaculation they do to try to inseminate beer bottles. And they're not actually having sex with each other anymore because the beer bottles are around. So they're like, it's like a fucking problem. It's like their porn. <laughs> it is. It's their porn. <laughs> yeah. It's their porn. And it's just the visual, it's the visual stimulation. So I think at the very least, that's one of the big differences between men and women. Yes. Uh, I was talking about the limbic brain. So yes, that makes sense. Visual cortex, limbic brain, dopamine hit. But, but after a while, there's like the law of returns goes into effect where yeah. you takes twice as much, you get uh, 50% less reward, and then it just goes on and on and on. This is why you see perversion. It's really easy to, to have perversion pervade in society because people just don't know they're on the addiction train. And so right. there has to be some kind of soul reckoning like I've shared with you where I, I had the entity, which actually was for my good. I know it was really shitty. I don't wish it upon anyone. I'm not sitting here blaming ayahuasca or even blaming the center. There's no mm. one to blame. It happened. Otherwise, you know, it, it was supposed to happen. Otherwise mm. it wouldn't happen. But when I look at pornography, like my learning curve did not have to be so long. <laughs> Right. It did not have to be so long. Like if I would have came across Gary Wilson's work earlier, Your Brain on Porn, or even listened to some of Jordan Peterson, um, I could have shortened the curve. And so it's all perfect. It's also, as we've talked about, like it's painful at times. But I think when it comes to me guarding and being a shepherd for my son from 24-7, 365 porn at all times, the only way I can do that is by who I am. Right. I can tell him to not watch porn, I can, but if he gets an energy from me at all, like that is still in my life, then I'm out of integrity. Mm -hmm. Then I'm not being honest. And like I said earlier, like kids don't necessarily do everything you say. They, they, they watch who you are. They watch your beingness. Yeah. And so that's the way we do it. I don't think we're, we're ever going to be able to block our kids' phones or block their iPads or whatever crazy thing you is coming in the, the future. The forbidden is always even more appealing, yes, yes, right? And yes. So my thoughts on this, I don't know what the fuck to do with kids because I tr I believe you, I buy it, and I think that's a good step. But it's got to be, it's got to be real. It's got to be, it has it's got to be, be absolutely you. authentic. I'm with you 100. Yeah. percent They can sense out. They can, like you said, they sniff out so much more than we give ourselves credit. We think yeah. we're fooling them. We're not fooling shit. 
And our women. Yeah, exactly. So all of that, true, given, agreed. Yes, and I think that the allure of the pornography is it's such a strong drug. Yeah. It's, it, I find that it, it's probably going to be difficult to not, to, to say like, you're not like, I don't do this drug anymore, so you won't, right? And mm-hmm, they're going to be like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just took a hit of this drug and it was fucking crazy. My whole body <laughs> caught on fire. Like, I know dad, but like, so, so yeah. what I, what I think is, is that ultimately the way that you change a system, right, is you don't attack the system or block the system or cancel or censor the system. You create a new system that makes the old system obsolete. No doubt. You create something new that's better that actually makes the old way something that no longer is appealing. And I think what needs to emerge is a new, a whole new class of public erotica, call it porn 2.0, you know, this new class of public erotica that needs to replace, you know, needs to replace the existing one, but still allows for that impulse to be expressed, but done in a healthy way without the toxicity. And one of the, one of the ways, and again, this is what I've been, you know, talking to my rabbi about as well. Like you have a rabbi. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, and, and fundamentally the idea is like, all right, what is that? What does that look like? Well, certainly in my own experience of the aftertaste, which I think is the feeling, right? Like where, you know, yeah. like you did so you're like fucking A it, and then it sticks the, with you. It's the fruit of the war inside where, you know, you shouldn't, but you do anyways. Yep. That's what it feels and, like. And you just know, it's just like, it's just ash in your mouth when you finish. You're like, man, that was, that was not healthy. Or even unconscious sex. It's the same feeling. Of course. Of course. So finding ways to create something that actually allows access to that to step into that erotic fantasy but without that kind of poison now you know what i what i've experienced is if it's if i'm watching anything that like i filmed with my wife for example no bad aftertaste yeah doesn't matter how freaky we got you know what i mean we could fucking gone for it swinging off the fucking chandelier doesn't matter you know, and I use that as a metaphor. Obviously, that's not how freakiness goes actually in the bedroom. Nobody's trying to be, tar- maybe people are trying to be Tarzan. Yeah. No shame to those trying to be Tarzan. You're walking to somebody's house and there's like a sex swing <laughs> for in, their, sure. in their living room. For sure. For right. sure. So whatever, whatever, your, whatever your thing is. But there's never been an aftertaste to anything I've filmed because I've known that the, the way that it was engaged was with love. Mm. It started with love and it ended with love. No matter how freaky it got, no matter what waters we explored, like I remember the laughter that, that came afterwards. And I remember like that, how much we loved each other and how we held each other. So like that, that experience changes my interaction with that content, even though the content could appear very similar to something that I would have watched online and had a horrible taste. Mm. But that's difficult because at that point, I mean, that's just you and your own. So, so, so that's what I would, and again, the, the, so many minefields here to look at and so many caveats and like, so I think erotica that's engaged with with genuine love and respect and honoring of both the feminine and the masculine, particularly the feminine, because like the degradation of the feminine is a common thread in this erotica. Yeah. And it can be accessed, but it has to be accessed with the willing submission of the feminine, the desire of the feminine to be that based on a container of love, safety, trust, admiration, worship. So it could be visually depicted, but the thing that's been really interesting to me is uh, like fiction, like erotic fiction, like written word. And like with Fabio on the cover with his hair flowing. Sim- like similar kind of idea. But you think about like what Fifty Shades of Grey, when Fifty Shades of Grey hit, I remember I would, I would go through the airport and I was in one particular plane and I looked around me and there was like, five different women of different ages and different different genders creed not gender different races different creed different whole like you could tell the whole vibe was different all of them reading 50 shades of gray at one point and it was like and they're and they're you know kind of squirming in their seats as they're like real like i was like oh shit like this this must be something like it's really getting people excited and in that i think when the imagination is activated rather than just seeing something that actually literally happened and you tell a beautiful story even if it's really like erotic and graphic and visceral yeah then i think that's another healthy way to like experience erotica without it being quote 
porn and leaving that nasty aftertaste. So I've been actually myself dabbling in like writing erotic fiction, you know, and and I think that whole category could, and of course it's not going to eradicate porn 1.0, that they'll always be there, just like yeah. there's always going to be, you know, I think there's a lot better drugs than, you know, cocaine and, you know, a lot of these other really drugs that have a, yeah, they work, but yes. they leave you with a really bad aftertaste. You know, there's just better drugs out there and there's going to be better drugs out there. And I think my goal will be to teach my children, like, look, I know you're going to want, I know you're going to want drugs. You're going to want the Eros drugs of public erotica. These are the ways that you can do it healthfully. And these are the ways that you can do it unhealthfully. Same with actually your diet. Like you want something really sweet, like yeah. this fucking keto cookie tastes delicious and it's you're gonna feel good when you're done and this fucking hostess cupcake thing you're gonna feel like <laughs> shit when yeah. you're done you know and, and it's you're but you're gonna be accessing a lot of the same same stuff it's just the whole aftertaste in your whole life is gonna feel different if you go this way but the way you're accessing it it's more real it's more organic it's more it's more life accessing it like when you and i were growing up we had to work really hard to get porn yeah so if somebody, I love this because it's like this return to somewhat of innocence, right? Yeah. Like by reading something, there's a whole different faculty that comes on in the brain. You might not get as much dopamine. You might not get as much activation of the limbic system. And so I, I actually think that's a really good thing. I think that's a beautiful thing, um, especially in our world where you, you're right. Like, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like for Nova to have whatever his device is, it'll probably be like a patch that he wears and he'll tap the patch and it'll just boom, come up. You know? I remember glasses. Gary Vaynerchuk was like, you, you guys better watch out because eventually people are going to put those lenses on their eyes and they're not going to want to come out. They're going to want to stay in there, which is what the whole fucking metaverse bullshit is all about. And I do mean bullshit. I understand that people think that it's this way, great way to connect and all that, but it's actually connecting in a fake world. So if right. we were to read erotic stories or if we were to just like, I'm just really feeling this right now because, wow, I mean, I really feel like my woman saved me, honestly. Like she, mm -hmm. like I was, I was in the throes of addiction really bad. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to say, I love you, Carrie. You know, yeah. thank, thank you for saving me because I really, I didn't have a way of navigating that world. And so I'll share that experience with my son about the, the lessons that I've learned. And hopefully, because I can't control any outcome. But hopefully my way of being and my honesty about what I've been through with him and the way I relate to her and, and the way our union feels and the way our union is, he can do whatever he wants because he, he knows what realness feels like. Right. He, he knows what the real thing is. So he never, I never have to have fear of him getting caught up in that world. Right. Because he, he knows my story and he knows our way of being. Right. He's, got, that, a living, he's got a living model. Dude, that's the greatest gift I could ever give him. Yeah. I mean, that's the best thing I could ever give him is, is that way of being. And, and that is a daily basis, right? Because there's lots of trappings. I don't know what it's like to have built a company as large as you, but I'm building my podcast and we're growing. And so there's, for all men, there's lots of, with energy and with notoriety comes distraction, comes lots of other things like female attention and whatnot. And so that is always something that myself as a father, I have to tend to. Am I being emotionally lazy? Am I having little moments here and there where I'm enjoying the cooling of, of, of feminine energy? That's not my woman's. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? And to what degree is that okay? Mm -hmm. These are all things that I think about quite a lot, mm -hmm. you know, especially with my background. So I, I think my son is going to feel that my way of being my truth and he knows what it feels like to be in the presence of a mom and dad that actually love each other, that have been through a lot together, that have been kind of bruised and battered and we have our scars, we have our stuff, but we have a way of being that he can connect to. Yeah, I think that is the ultimate teaching tool for him that no um, porn guard where I'm trying to like look at his URL or work. me telling my child not to do something with my finger pointed like, that has no bearing in the, in the world of distraction that you and I are stepping into. My son is one year old. I can't even imagine, Aubrey, the world that he's going to be in when he's 10. I mean, 10 years ago, where were you? Where was I? Sure. Can, can we even conceptualize in 10 years the level of distraction and, and the call to you and I to be strong enough to withstand that distraction as fathers and also to be able to articulate that to our children? Holy shit what a journey we're about to go on. I mean, it's going to be fun, but it's also going to be, it's going to be intense. I feel like the intensity is going to ramp up actually. Yeah. And, and I, I can feel too that, 
you know, when, when I do have kids, it'll just really, really cause me to take a look at all of the different patterns and the different things that I am, that I'm experiencing. And I know that at the very least, radical transparency and honesty is going to be key and like helping them understand yeah. to the same degree that, that I understand it. But for example, and I said, I was going to bracket this and talk about it. You know, I had, um, you know, like really depressive episode last night, like really like just in the, in the bleakness of it hmm. and no reason for it. You know, I had no, no real, and actually Christian, can you run? I left my phone out there on the, on the table. I actually forced myself to write and I'll actually share what I wrote. Um, but it was like, it just fucking came out of nowhere, man. And it's not like it was something new. I've had this for most of my life, like periods where just the depression comes in and, and I have my own techniques to try and overcome it. I know, but sometimes nothing's working and sometimes I don't know where it's from and I don't know why it's there. And if that still comes when my son's around, like it needs to be addressed. What cannot happen, what cannot happen is my son or my daughter, you know, I, I believe I'm going to have both. If they witness that and they're just like, what's up with that? And then, you know, I, it, like it has to be like, we know we talk about it, yeah, you know, and just like express from my heart, like this is something and I don't even have all the answers to it, but this is what it feels like for me. And this is like, this is this pattern. It doesn't, you know, maybe sometime you'll feel like this. Maybe you never will. Hopefully not. Hopefully yeah. not. You know, but I think that radical honesty, but also the impulse to like, all right, let's fucking get to the bottom of this. Like, let's figure it out because I don't want you to, I don't even want to have to go through all of those explanations unless I need to. And I will, of course, you know, but I'd much rather like rectify and find the answer to this riddle. And it's a, it's a riddle that I haven't quite solved. And I'm curious, like I, I'm curious whether I've started to make strict because it's come on more frequently recently. So I've started to make a bit stricter dietary decisions because I know that like, you know, pro-inflammatory cytokines going to the brain is one of the big triggers and correlatives to depression. You got to watch certain, out for the barbecue here then. There's yeah. hidden shit in there. Well, and it's also the smoke. Meat. The smoke is also something that I've noticed too is like really ramps up my inflammation is mm. when, when meat is smoked, Mm. you're actually thinking about the smoke and again obviously we have smoke coming out of our mouth now but we're not inhaling it yeah in the same way and it's it's tobacco and i'm sure this has some infl inflammatory process as well but it's chosen but when you're eating the meat that has been slow smoked for like days i can feel the difference of smoked even if i have smoked turkey versus mm -hmm. regular turkey so lots of little clues for me about inflammation that i have to be really mindful of cut out you know i've noticed a correlation between like gluten foods and non-gluten foods. I'm not celiac or anything like that, but just one's a little bit more inflammatory, like raw milk versus, you know, not raw milk, homogenized milk, big difference there. Fried foods for sure. I just fucking hard stop on all fried foods, even though they're goddamn delicious. Yes. Like that contributes to me having more depressive, you know, episodes and, and depressive kind of, and I don't even like calling it depression. It's just like a depressive period, like depression is moving through me. Yeah. I think when you pathologize something, it becomes even greater than what it is and it can be helpful, but it's not like, I think it's also problematic. So like as depression was with me last night or moving through me and like a depressive fog and I'm just doing my best to figure it out. But some part of me is wondering like, do I need to go fucking straight carnivore or do I need to go hmm. like full keto? Yeah. Or do I, because I know when I fast, I know when I fast, I don't get depressive episodes when I fast. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I do know, but I can't fast all the time. I like being fucking yeah. athletic. You'd have lots shit. of headaches if you were fasting all the time. <laughs> right. So do you ever, two things came up for me. Like one is just, and I know you've talked about this and I know you know how to do this on an intellectual level. I still struggle with it. Holding my heart and like laying on my bed and actually letting it mm -hmm. move through, mm -hmm. there's something in me that sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm not good. Right. Sometimes I don't want it to move through. Is that is that what you experience yeah. sometimes? So let, me, you... let me express, I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna read this. So I know also that writing typically helps. That's the only way I can be cathartic is when I write things And down. when I write and know that potentially I'll share it, there's some part of me that, that, and I think it's that service, you know, acts of service are one of the clearest correlations in all the clinical research to actually eliminating depression is when you're of service to others. So by expressing what I feel, 
then they, it's not only expressing it for me, which is helpful, which is also another proven way to actually help with your what you're moving through, but also the fact that I'm going to share it also makes it feel like, okay, maybe this was worth it. And it, it kind of reifies my purpose and like part of what I'm here for. But man, it was fucking tough last night. And again, no reason. Just was like, and it just hit heavy. So this is what came out. So I brought my computer out and I was like, I, I just got to write. <clears throat> And this is not like a great poem or anything, because obviously, but whatever. The words slump onto the page, a labor to release them. I pull them out of me like lodged cactus spines. I don't want to write. There is no poetry in my heart. My words are not light and my pain has no art. I have no story to tell. No raging grief, blazing jealousy or blackened shame. Absolutely nothing to blame. But still I write, because I know each new word is the stirring of fight, a bleak ray of sunshine in the fog of gray. I hear my queen humming in the next room, like a bumblebee milking a flower, or sweet honey on the lips of a bear. Yet I have no humming beak, nor the fluttering wings, to drink from her pool of petals. My darkness is an old friend, a very old friend. He comes to stay for a while, neither cruel nor vile, just persistent. Am I resistant? No. But neither can I surrender, nor can I accept. What am I to do? It's not a secret I have kept, nor tears unwept. The lesson is a maze, the teaching is a riddle. Why can't I see what is here for me? I am tired, weary, dreary, neither warrior or poet nor drunkard or addict. Yet here I am. I am here. And that's all I can say. How long will I stay? Blessed am I, for tomorrow is a new day. Today is a new day. What are you here to teach me? <laughs> that's really, that's the voice of it, right? What are you here to teach me? Yeah. <laughs> when the icy hand, like the war of the worlds comes in. Because the, the honey's there. Like I was, I, I actually was like, wow, the honey would taste really good right now. Yeah. Um, but damn, that question, I don't, I don't have the answer for that, but I know that when I do ask that, it's easier. It's a yeah, lot easier. Sure. Like I there's inside of me been just this dark hole for the majority of my life. I don't exactly know where it comes from, but it makes me fawn. I have a tendency to fawn. You know, it's one of the trauma responses. So I fawn with people when I start to feel that uncomfortable with that darkness, with that depression. And so here I am talking about it, right? Like it's, it's a good thing to talk about it. And I think that's so beautiful, man. It's so fucking great that you have this place where you can share where other people around the world can be like, wow, I'm totally not alone. Yeah, I'm totally not alone. I laid on my bed last night too, Aubrey, and fuck, it really sucked. And I feel like that question that honestly our, our friend Paul taught me uh, three, four years ago, like what is it here to teach me? Right. When I was going through all the OCD and like my psyche broke from that medicine serum, it took me almost two years to heal that. I mean, I was having crazy shit go on, like weird sexual stuff coming up. I think it was a clean out from the porn, sure. honestly. Because every time I watched porn, I would micro traumatize myself. And, and honestly, it, it was here to teach me that like there's some contrast that I'm not looking at. There's something that I'm not looking at, not out of shame. Mm -hmm. I'm not shaming the shit out of myself for not seeing it. Like, oh, I should see it. I just think it's beautiful that you have a reflective practice where you can write for catharsis and you can wonder, you can be curious, like, okay, what are you here to teach me? And not bat a thousand yeah. and not have to like beat yourself up if you don't get it. Cause like yeah. the next day is coming. Yeah. It feels like that in the moment, but you, you, you seem to me like, I know it's your show, but I got to ask you a question. Cause I love podcasting too. What is it about your drive to create like Arcadia and uh, fit for service and all these things. There's a love there, but then do you also feel the drive because there's the dark, because there's that unanswerable question of what are you here to teach me? Why do you, why does this old friend keep coming back? In other words, does that fuel you too? 
Mm. And if so, how much love fuels you versus how much of the dark? Mm. It's, uh, it's difficult to say, you know, it's, I think, um, there used to be a lot more justification for egoic motivation to do things. But to me, it was always very simple. And I've talked about this on podcasts too. Is it's also, it was very simple for me. I love the world, one, motivation one. Truly, I do. Yeah. I like, I want to help. And like, that's what I'm here for. And the more that I help, the bigger my platform, the more successful I am, the more likely I am to meet women who love me too you know like it was huh. always it was always about it was always about the feminine it was always about like can i find my queen can i and if, if i was polyamorous like can i find the next paramour that's gonna thrill me and so much was kind of it was very reductionist in my mindset like i i didn't really i never really cared about the even though i'm very competitive in sports and stuff like that that wasn't the thing that drove me that what drove me was like man i want to be like the most awesome so that i could attract the most awesome woman when i meet her and then yeah i fucking i did it like here i am with vailana she's a, like my dream woman top to bottom and then so that that part of that motivation died off so now i'm moving you know i have to fuel myself from love um so there's definitely that's definitely been a recalibration the the part of me that's trying to give myself purpose to actually combat the combat the darkness is certainly there as well and that's what i was saying like service to others is a yeah. way to actually help modulate my own depression so in some ways that is self-serving in that the more i help the world the better i actually feel inside like i've never you know i do I've been an apprentice with Parangi in a particular type of body work. And so I can bring people into a body work journey. And when I'm doing that, there's never been a moment where I was depressed, nor any day that I've offered yeah. that, that I've been depressed because I know that I just showed up in devotional service to somebody for two, three hours. And it feels really good to me. So there's definitely another part of me that's doing that to, to fight back the darkness, to say like, the more I serve, the less dark I feel. Mm -hmm. and um and so one of the inquiries i'm in is i'm in a very i'm in a transitional stage of my life right now and i think part of the darkness is pointing me towards potentially there's an even another level of service that i could reach where i'm offering something even more potent you know or not more potent i don't i don't want to be comparative to that but like something else I'm being called to do that I haven't been doing. And maybe that's what it's trying to show me. Maybe it's just, it's the universe saying like, you feel like you do now because there's more that you know, I know inside that I can give that I'm not giving. And mm -hmm. maybe there's some part of me that's still afraid. And potentially it's, maybe that is like what we've been talking about with sexuality here. Like I just, you know, revealed on this podcast here for the first time like i'm writing erotic fiction but i'm like i have no i'm like no way am i going to share it yet <laughs> you know what i mean it's like depending on who the characters are right yeah. it's like and and it's you know it's it's the it's the exploration of fantasy and power exchange and all of these different things and and maybe this is a similar experience to what i was experiencing when you know in the pandemic where it was like there was things that i wanted to say and share that i wasn't sharing and that was causing me to feel this suffocating feeling maybe maybe not maybe it's a false flag and that has nothing to fucking do with it and i'm just still in the curiosity and the listening because i didn't write the fiction for anybody but myself mm -hmm. you know i just wanted to write it because it was a way to explore a whole different world you know in a healthy way to explore the different world rather than you know because i've looked at porn in my life too so yeah. rather than doing that, like let's explore it through this, through the creation of characters and story and and all of this. And maybe it has nothing to do with that. And maybe it has more to do with, you know, spiritual slash religious ideas that still are like a little, you know, I kind of keep to myself. It's possible that this is part of my knowing, like 
now is the time to just stop giving any fucks about how many haters I get or how many people come after me for my truth. Yeah. And maybe that's it. I don't know. I'm just, all I can say right now is I'm just in the listening and trying to figure out what it is that this is trying to tell me and what it's trying to compel me, you know, what next level of service it's trying to compel me to because service is the only thing that fights off the darkness. I feel the same way. Like whenever I'm doing something for someone else, this is why I love podcasting. In the middle of podcasting, I'm never thinking about my darkness. No. Right? I mean, unless I'm asked, then I'll share. But whenever I'm serving or helping to serve someone else's mission or putting someone else on a spotlight, it lights me up. It's like, it's like makes me feel from my whole life, I wanted to be a DJ, you know, like old school DJ, yeah, yeah. like Adam Carolla, Dr. Drew. I used to listen to them when they had the cassette tapes behind me when I was a teenager. And I'm like, oh, one day I'll be on the radio. I found the radio and all the people were drug addicts and like alcoholics, like being a DJ ain't that great y'all. So when podcasting came around, I was like, wow, there was a part of me that started to heal because of it. Podcasting saved my life. Carrie saved my life. But podcasting saved my life too. I don't know what the hell I would be doing in this world if it wasn't for this, like true communion at a table where we get to share each other's messages. Like that is the everything to me. Mm. So I think that catharsis comes in many forms. Like you're a writer. Um, I write too. I've never written like uh, the mystery stuff or the the sex stuff, but Mm -hmm. it's interesting. But I think that catharsis is like the key. It's like if we're not getting it out, if we're not letting the decaying snake skin die and we're mm-hmm. holding on to it because it has to be a certain way, it makes me reflect on my life. What am I holding on to that has to be a way that my mind is telling me it has to be this way versus how fucking amazing it could it be for me to just like let the skin peel off, let some things die. Yeah, I mean, catharsis is the only way. And, and there's a catch there because catharsis could also mean um, unchecked hedonism as well, right. where I, I just go left field and I'm constantly partying because that's my catharsis. What I'm saying is like, there's a healthy way for catharsis. We talked about the middle way. Sometimes catharsis might look like doing a bunch of drugs and partying in Vegas, or sometimes it might yeah. look like just if the, sitting. If the confines are a little too tight, sometimes yes. you need to blast through the confines and be Hunter S. Thompson for a day and, hey. then, and then find your way like, yes. okay, fucking did that. Don't need to do that again. <laughs> And then sometimes it might, catharsis might just be like having your wife hold you. And so you can just cry for a moment. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's beautiful, honestly. Of course. I mean, in the beginning of my journey, when Carrie and I first got together, she probably held me like once a month. Mm -hmm. I would just let shit go. I think it's really beautiful. Now to many people watching, they might be like, what? You're going to let me like, my wife's going to hold me while I cry. What the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) But it's powerful, man. It's really powerful. And I think the more we can be honest with each other and honest with ourselves, mm-hmm. the better we're going to be as a society. That's but, bottom line. but if it's up to, if it's up to me, it's going to be and vice versa. If it's going to be in the world, it's got to be within me first. I fell into that trap many, many times. So the world needs that. The world needs people who are willing to get fucking real and throw down on a table and say, this is, this is what's going on for me. This is what's actually occurring in my life. Yeah. And I'm curious what you feel might help me assuage that pain, might help me understand my pain more. And just like Bruce Lee said, like, take what resonates, leave the rest. Sometimes I get a lot of people that come on the show and I don't agree with what they say. And I really challenge them because one per- one person's catharsis is not everyone's. Yeah. And, you know, also having a podcast and being a, you know, being a public figure in any way is both incredibly liberating and, and, self-actualizing in a lot of ways but you have to be careful that it doesn't become a prison how so what do you mean well you know in some ways like and i've done a pretty good job being kind of boundaryless in my content and but i could have very very easily been like another human optimization guy i wrote own the day i ran the company on it and it could have been like and there's a lot of people who would, when I would post something about relationship or post something about, especially like when Own the Day really like popped and became a bestseller and all that, where people who didn't know me from my podcast with Rogan or didn't listen to my show, like were following me for that. And they're like, I just came here for the kettlebell workouts, bro. What the fuck is all this? Do I put red light on my balls now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, well, even, or other stuff. I'm talking about (laughs) like self-love and, you know, relationship healing and, yeah. and all of these like deep deeper they're like i don't i didn't fucking come here for this i came here because you're the only day guy yeah you know what i mean and um and i think you can get stuck in in different lanes 
that actually become prisons to a certain degree where it's mm. like you have to show the same thing and it works but it also if it's not your true expression then it's also going to become like a gilded cage ha huh. for you to live inside if you have an identity or a brand that has to live up to certain standards and that's the thing like you do create a brand and the brand has certain parameters like the brand can't constantly evolve that's going to the brand is not even going to make sense yeah you know you have to really focus a brand so that it penetrates the market to the degree that you want and you do that with like product brands and that's what we did with on and that's what you do with a product brand but when your brand is yourself you have to be really fucking careful because then and we do this even in our social circles you know where, where our own brand even if we don't try to make a brand people are putting us in this kind of category themselves like i remember i used to party a lot in my 20s and you know me and caitlin we were good at partying we put out a lot of energy we'd stand on tables and dance and fucking let it rip some days i just didn't want to do that i just wanted to sit around and like let the party happen and and people would come up like what's wrong with you man what's wrong with you why aren't you on the tables like because yeah. my brand was the guy who's, who's wild and parties and so that became like a, a prison for me so i felt like i was letting people down if i didn't do what they wanted me to do mm. and i think i think whatever wherever this next chapter goes it's going to be about e deepening even more than i already have my full spectrum authenticity and being like sorry y'all i know you want me to talk about mindset and physical optimization and all this but i'm just going to be writing poetry and erotic fiction for the next three months so that's what that's what's live for me right now it's not that i don't yeah. love the rest it's just this is the season i'm in and that's what i want to talk about or this other this other thing this other topic this other season like i'm going to talk about that and i think that freedom is something that i can see for me is going to be important and i don't know what that freedom exactly looks like mm. but uh and i am very i am very free but i think part of my nature is I want to be like completely free, like truly, truly free. And of course, I'm bound by my own internal ethics and my own internal morality of constantly seeking the truth, radically willing to admit when I'm wrong. You know, like all of that has to be in place. Seeing through everybody else, I'm not going to violate those things. That's who I am. But if I did, I would surely want to, you know, it's part of my responsibility to share that as well mm. and also receive the feedback of like, it's fucked up, bro. You know, like, you <laughs> yeah. know, like, damn, I like, didn't see it from that perspective. When something's not working, the soul will create chaos so that it eventually works. In other words, uh, this year, February on 2 22 I completely killed wellness force as a brand. The word force, the etymology of force, like it can't always be trusted, like a force of nature. And I always felt like for the past two years that I wasn't really in 100% integrity on my show. Like right. something was off. Something just didn't feel right. right. And Carrie and I did a mushroom journey on New Year's Eve and she rolls over and I was sharing with her, like, I don't feel like I'm in alignment, like something's wrong. She's like, well, why don't you, why don't you just get rid of force and replace it with wisdom? And I was just like, oh, that's it. Like mm -hmm. wisdom is what I'm always seeking. Right. And I'm imperfect in the way I seek it, but I'm always seeking more wisdom. And wisdom isn't just information. Like I think I got caught up in the game where a lot of podcasters, they just interview people. It's like, Aubrey, what's the five ways that I can biohack my body or what's the five ways that mm -hmm. I can do it. And honestly, when I made that shift, damn, I feel better. Yeah. Like now the podcast is wellness and wisdom instead of wellness force. And I'm like, oh, okay. It opens up this bigger cavern for me to explore yeah. where I can share about my addiction. I can share about my stuff. I can just be my fucking self. That feels so good compared to what it used to feel like because I was doing it because it was what other podcasters did to be successful. Yeah. And that was a massive turn. Since then, everything has exploded. I have a private studio now. I work out of the house. Like things are good. And I know like you, like there's something else too. So there's like this muse calling me forward. I don't exactly know what it's going to look like. Just stay in the But I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy it. Right. But I'm going to yeah. enjoy it from me sitting here with you. Just being honest. Mm -hmm. Even if it's like crunchy when I share, like there's been multiple things that we've talked about where I'm like, should I share that? <laughs> of course. Should I fucking share that? Of like course. with all these people? And it's like, the answer is always yes. The answer is always yes for yeah. me to share. That's what really liberates. Always. That's what really liberates us. Yes. And, uh, and I think the, 
Yeah, I remember I switched my podcast from the Warrior Poet Project to the Aubrey Marcus podcast. Because when was that? That was six, seven years ago, oh, that maybe. Was early that in the was game. early in the game. Seven yeah. years ago, maybe. Okay. And the reason was, it was like, well, Warrior Poet is a brand and I, it would have to live up to a certain brand. And I'm like, sometimes I'm resonating with that brand and sometimes I'm not. But if I just call it my name, then that pretty much people can expect I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about, you know? But the slippery, the slippery part of that is that it doesn't really matter because fundamentally people are going to put Aubrey Marcus into a brand anyways. And, you know, so, so now it's, now it's about actually evolving the brand of Aubrey Marcus to be the full spectrum human that I am in its most radical extension. And I think now is also a period, I think we went through a period where all of us had to encounter what it was like to have a, have an opinion that we weren't comfortable sharing. Like the yeah. 2020 gave us plenty of opportunities <laughs> to yeah. like, to, to go that and, and the world we're in now has plenty of opportunities to do that. And I think that was kind of the forging of a, of a certain type of courage. And I think that courage is going to be necessary as we continue to go through this next period where you're just willing to share what you feel and and then deal with the consequences. You know, it's almost like there's a part of me that's actually going back to the warrior poet ethos. Like, all right, what does the warrior poet do? The poet feels everything to the fullest extent that it could possibly be felt. That's the, that's the code of the poet. Shares it. That's also the second part of the code of the poet. Feel everything to the depth of the feeling possible and share it. And the warrior is the part that is willing to go into the darkness and willing to take the arrows and willing to stand up to whatever challenges come their way and use that as a forging process to to alchemize their strength and teach them courage so it's an interesting and beautiful journey we're on here brother. i feel like after courage comes peace because a lot of times people are like well what comes first peace or courage peace is always in my opinion after courage because courage is like uncomfortable. <laughs> it's not, to have courage is not really peaceful. Like if I'm having courage to stand up to anything in life, I'm going to go through a period of compression. Like I'm, it's going to suck for a moment. I'm going to have to like feel my value, feel the love for myself and, and have the balls to stand up for whatever it is I believe in. And I think after courage comes peace. It's like, we all, don't we all just want peace? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, isn't, isn't that what this game is all about? We just want to feel peaceful. I know that's been my story. How do I feel peace? Yeah. Well, I have to go through some times where I have to summon the courage in order for me I to feel peace afterwards. Both. I think we want to feel peace and I think we like a fight. What's the split on that? 70-30? Yeah, I 30 don't know. 30% courage, 70% yeah, yeah. peace? Like, I mean, I think if things are too chill for too long, we'll be yeah. like, man, I miss, the, I miss when it was heated, when it was difficult, when it was challenging. I'm watching a show right now called Sandman and it's a, like, a big show on Netflix. I have my gripes with the show, but also there's What's some like, beautiful part of it. It's about these uh, these divine beings that are also very flawed and anthropomorphized, um, but that represent like the main character represents sleep. So it's you know the god Morpheus, yeah. and then there's the you know the goddess Desire, and then there's the you know despair and death and all of these different. They call them the endless, and it's about their that's the world that they're in and how they interact with people but in the show you know he and i won't give spoilers but he basically finishes one of his quests a deep quest a quest that took him through a deep period of darkness and a deep period of failure and he accomplishes the quest and then i was surprised where the episode went and it was like him in despondency because he was more powerful than he'd ever been but he'd finished the quest and he was like, I thought this was, would bring me happiness. I thought my world is in order. My kingdom is in order. Everything is calm. And he was just absolutely despondent because like when he was in the quest, he had like a clear, hot, yeah. burning purpose and a fire that was lit inside him. And when that ended, then he was like, well, what do I do now? I miss it. I miss the fire of that of that experience. So I think it's both. I think like being able to enjoy and truly enjoy the rapture of peace yeah. and then also know that 
some of us are just built and we're built to go into the fray. We're built to have a, a quest and difficulty and challenge. And I see that with in the world right now. I see that with a lot of the people who are preparing for potential cataclysmic situations, right? Like some part of them, even though their compassion and their kindness and the love in their heart doesn't want anything bad to happen in the world, some part of them is craving something bad to happen so they can apply all of their skills of foraging and, sub and protecting their family and dealing with all the things that are coming up. You know, earlier you said that the middle way is sometimes killing someone. Well, that's, I think, what we're leading up to. This is just my experience. It doesn't have to be everyone else's. I'm actually welcoming the disruption. I'm t I've felt it ever since I was a little kid. Like, why do y'all treat each other so bad? What is this all about? Like, when I was super young, I used to ask this question, like, how come life hurts so much? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how come things hurt so much? I, I think it's because we see each other as separate and we're pitted against each other by, who knows, you could call it like the top of the spider, like David Icke. I don't really know what it is, honestly. Like, is there a room of 50 old white men that control the world? Maybe, maybe not. I I'm not uh, fully- To me, I think it's likely an anthropomorphization of an archetypal force. Yes. And actually people are just participating in that force to varying different degrees. I find it hard to imagine a group full of fucking old white guys who are trying to plan everything out, but it's possible. Well, there's evil in the world for sure. It, yeah. But as an energy. Absolutely. No doubt. There, you can't and, deny and have that archetypal people. energy and certain people participate in that energy. Yeah. Whether they are the absolute embodiment of that energy. Yes. I don't fucking know. There is the warrior inside of me though that's that's welcoming. I, I don't want people to die. My grandpa was a brigadier general. He was the first Sicilian in the Marine Corps uh, in like the 20s. Like he he made it. They put gave him the key to the city. So like that's within me. Like I I have deep reverence and deep love for my grandfather. Like I've I've had many conversations with him. He's been gone for over 20 years. I still talk to him. Mm -hmm. I, there's still an honoring there. And I know he did the best he could. He he fought in many wars where, you know, maybe there wasn't an imminent threat, although World War II, there absolutely was. I mean, we were very close to losing World War II yeah. for all the history buffs out there. So I, I do think that we're coming, even if you look at that book, The Fourth Turning, I'm trying to digest it right now. It's just really cold reading The Fourth Turning. I don't know if you've heard of mm -hmm. it or not, but supposedly we are coming into one of the darkest times. Now, after the dark is going to come light. So I, I am welcoming this because I want to feel more peace. I want us to all have more peace. And in order for us to have that, we have to be summoned into courage right now yeah i don't want it to be that way but fuck i'm like please can we stop the charade but that see some part of you does want it and some part of me does want it that's i want the, it because i thing. want the peace yes yes i think that's yes and that also is a potentially a slight justification for actually wanting the narrowing of focus and the aliveness that comes from being in contact with imminent threat. Like there's a radical aliveness that comes when you are in contact with an imminent threat. Like for anybody who's competed in martial arts, like when you're in an intense martial arts match, you're not thinking about shit. It's like, this is the only thing that matters. There's this one person who wants to hurt me and it's my job to hurt them first. You know, and like, that's yeah. the only thing, like there's, there's a, there's a bliss. It's the deepest primal experience one could ever maybe experience. Right. I, <laughs> I, uh, I just, uh, I just, I'm rewatching Game of Thrones because it's Vailana's first time oh, you to watch hooked. it. I've never, I've never started. Oh, dude, it's I've so never fucking started. good. It's so fucking good. I'm, I'm, I appreciate it even more now than I did then. And I loved it then. But there's, there's a character, uh, Dario Naharis, and he's played by, in season three by my friend, Ed Skrein and Ed's, Ed's, he didn't carry on the character. They had some disagreements with HBO or whatever. But in season three, he gets to play this character. And he's pretty quickly upon getting introduced, he says this line. He's like, you know, I am a simple man. I like to fuck a woman who wants to fuck me. And I like to kill a man who is trying to kill me. And like when he first said that, I thought like a, like ten years ago or whatever. When I watched that, I was like, "That's a badass thing to say." But now I'm like, "Oh, I fucking get it, man!" Like those are the two points in your life where you feel the most radically alive, and like that's what you live for. You live for the radical aliveness. So what you stand for at the core level is the most 
radical aliveness. So that man, in peace, he would just have sex with a lot of women who wanted to have sex with him, right? Mm -hmm. And it was that was contrast to the kind of whore culture that was, you know, pervasive in in Game of Thrones. He's like, no, not for me. I will never do that because it doesn't. I don't feel alive when I'm paying for something. Like it has to be the allurement, the desire. Yeah. I have to be met in that desire, and then I feel alive. Or and I don't also want to kill somebody. No, I only want to kill them if they also want to kill me. That's what makes me alive. And like, I think there's a part of us, and obviously this is an extreme example of two different types of what you know Rabbi Gaffney would call eros, like the the kind of narrowing of your life into this radical interiority and presence of the moment. So yes to peace, I think it's something we all want, but we yeah. also all want to feel like we're right here in the moment and there's nothing else in the whole world that we're thinking about or doing. And that's also what we crave. And if that means that there's a big conflict, I think you know, part of us craves the conflict because that will bring us to that state. I was thinking about that last night. Like if I was in the middle of that depression and somebody tried to break into the house, would I be depressed five seconds later? Fuck no. You know, I would have grabbed the gun and I would have like enacted the plan. All right, Vi, you go here. This is, you know, where are they at? This is the vest. This is your, this is your backup weapon. This is my primary weapon. This is where we go. This is our, it would have just been straight, like fucking action, execution. Here's how we protect ourselves. Here's how we get out of this situation. And the depression would have been gone in like a fucking instant. But yeah. in this kind of lavish peace, there was this deep darkness that was in there. And actually what pulled me out of it is, you know, Vailana and I made love and that, <laughs> that helped. So I, I guess there is a little Dario Naharis in, yeah. me, in me as well, you know, but uh, yeah, I just see that. And, and so it also gives me another perspective on everything in the world that perhaps things have been so peaceful and we don't know how to deal with that peace in, in, in enough of a way that mm. we want some conflict to actually bring out our higher virtues and our valor and our courage and our bravery and um, at least those of us who have that archetype within them. I think I definitely do. I, I just had like a spiritual growth moment here just sitting with you because I'm thinking about like that's in my DNA. So if my grandfather was truly a warrior for his time, it's activating in me when I feel threat. Yeah, like totally. It, it's coming online. Some part of you is coming alive. Some part of me is like, don't, oh, you want to fuck with me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I think to some degree that's healthy. I think that's good. Now, unchecked, not cool. Nope. Like unintegrated anger, non-sacred anger. Like obviously I'm not a proponent of violence. I'm not like we should go kill China. I mean, let's not even talk no. about what's going on in China. But but truly like if if death or if if something comes to me, if the threat of death comes to me, I'll do everything in my power to live. I'll do everything yeah. in my power to live. And we need that. And I think that's being um, trained out of a lot of men. There's a lot of feminization of men right now. And I'm not saying that we all should like have an American flag everywhere in our house and have <laughs> lots of guns and like eat barbecue for every meal and drive a Chevrolet. Like, even though I'm, I'm getting a Chevy truck, which is so interesting. <laughs> I'm just realizing that right now. Um, but I do think, I think there is, um, I think there's a natural harmony of life. And I think sometimes that harmony leads us to violence and leads us to uncomfortable things. I mean, that's why, that's it's why the snake been, eats its tail. That's why the yin yang exists. Like the, we're always, always we're always flowing. We're always going on sides. And I feel like right now we're in a big crunch phase, but you know, to quote Kelly Brogan, like the, the healing spiral, it's like right now I feel like we're in a contraction mm. and eventually we're going to be in expansion. I so think, I, I welcome yeah. the expansion too. I think peace is a skill that, needs to be practiced, trained, and sought with the same tenacity that the skill of war is practiced, trained, and taught, mm. right? Like to be really good at peace, you need to go through the same type of Tim Kennedy fucking preparation for combat that and conflict, wild. right? Like mm. he is, he is he's, fucking, he's the real deal. He is yeah. the pr premier example of what, you know, what kind of mentality, physicality, everything that you would need for war of any sort hand to hand or you know whatever whatever the fucking conflict is like he's trained himself for that and i think peace is of an equal challenge to master and i think that's somebody like ramdas ramdas is like the tim kennedy of peace you know like really like he trained himself yeah. to that degree to be able to hold peace 
with that level of mastery. And I think both, both are like to be a fully robust, you know, human in this experience, train yourself with the same tenacity for both sides, both the warrior, the poet, the, the, you know, the peaceful monk, like trained to be all these archetypes, practice mm. makes a master. Well, since we started this podcast with fatherhood, that is exactly what being a father has been for me so far. Yeah. Just what you just said. Sometimes I feel like I need to protect and be at war. Sometimes I feel like I just need to soften and just be at peace right now. And it's a constant, I guess you could say, calibration for me. Yeah. And it's beautiful. I mean, I really do love it. Like having a, a life that I'm, having a life that I'm responsible for is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Like it, like even before I came over to the studio, I was like, hmm, what am I even doing this for? Why am I even coming on Aubrey's show? Like, what's this all about? Oh, I'm doing it for Nova. I'm doing it for my family. Like, that's what it's about. It's about, like you said, being both, being the protector, being the warrior, being the dad that can hold my son and lightning just struck. So that's, that's what a it's good about. Sign. Yeah. Brother, this has been a real pleasure, man. Thanks Thank you for so coming much. On. Thank you for the cigar. For sure. Thank you for this awesome conversation. For sure. Really appreciate what you've built, man. And and uh, there's a huge part of my heart that's grateful to be here in Austin. And you were very kind to me when I first got here. And a big part of my life unfolding in the way that it has is because of your intro to Tim. So huge gratitude for you for that. For of that course, intro. man. Of course. Yeah. And big shout out to your podcast, which is now Wellness and Wisdom. That's it. And yeah. uh, one thing I always appreciated kind of the start of our relationship was i was doing a lot of interviews for own the day at the time i think that was the first show we did yeah was, you're on a laptop in new york yeah and uh, i was on my book tour and i got a lot of shit interviews i had to say and then but your interview was one of my favorite because you really the fact that you care and that you're willing to do the work and do the research and like actually dive in read the fucking book get the right questions, go in deep and, and really explore the topic thoroughly. I was like, this dude is, this dude is legit. And so just big shout out to you and, and your podcast for anybody listening because you give a hell of a, hell of an interview and hell of a conversation. So lots, Thanks, of, good, lots of good stuff there. Thank you very much. Feels good to receive that from you. Of course, of course. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We love you. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.